Act One of Miss Sarah Sampson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miss Sarah Sampson, A Tragedy in Five Acts, by G. E. Lessing, Dramatis Personae, Sir William Sampson, played by Anthony. Miss Sarah Sampson, his daughter. Read by Arielle Lipshaw. Melifont. Read by Algie Pug. Marwood, formerly Melifont's mistress. Read by Avahi. Arabella, a child, daughter of Marwood. Read by Miss Avarice. Waitwell, an old servant of Sir William. Read by John Steigerwald. Norton, servant of Melifont. Read by John Fricker. Betty, Sarah's maid. Read by Nicole Thompson. Hannah, Marwood's maid. Read by Deborah Lee. The innkeeper. Read by David Lawrence. Servant. Read by M.B. Narrated by Elizabeth Clett. Act One. Scene One. A room in an inn. My daughter here, in this wretched inn... No doubt Malifont has purposely selected the most wretched one in the town. The wicked always seek the darkness, because they are wicked. But what would it help them, could they even hide themselves from the whole world? Conscience, after all, is more powerful than the accusations of a world. Ah, you are weeping again, again. Sir, sir. Let me weep, my honest old servant. Or does she not, do you think, deserve my tears? Alas, she deserves them were they tears of blood. Well, let me weep. The best, the loveliest, the most innocent child that ever lived beneath the sun must thus be led astray. Oh, my Sarah, my little Sarah, I have watched thee grow. A hundred times have I carried thee as a child in these arms. Have I admired thy smiles, thy lispings. From every childish look beamed forth the dawn of an intelligence, a kindliness, a... Oh, be silent. Does not the present rend my heart enough? Will you make my tortures more infernal still by recalling past happiness? Change your tone, if you'll do me a service. Reproach me. Make of my tenderness a crime. Magnify my daughter's fault. Fill me with abhorrence of her. If you can, stir up anew my revenge against her curse seducer. Say that Sarah never was virtuous, since she so lightly ceased to be so. Say that she never loved me, since she clandestinely forsook me. If I said that, I should utter a lie. A shameless, wicked lie. It might come to me again on my deathbed, and I, old wretch, would die in despair. No, little Sarah has loved her father, and doubtless, doubtless she loves him yet. If you will only be convinced of this, I shall see her again in your arms this very day. Yes, wait, well, of this alone I ask to be convinced. I cannot any longer live without her. She is the support of my age. And if she does not help to sweeten the sad remaining days of my life, who shall do it? If she loves me still, her error is forgotten. It was the error of a tender-hardened maiden, and her flight was the result of her remorse. Such errors are better than forced virtues. Yet I feel, wait well, I feel it. Even were these errors real crimes, premeditated vices, even then I should forgive her. I would rather be loved by a wicked daughter, than by none at all. Dry your tears, dear sir. I hear someone. It will be the landlord coming to welcome us. Scene 2 So early, gentlemen, so early. You are welcome. Welcome, Waitwell. You have doubtless been travelling all night. Is that the gentleman of whom you spoke to me yesterday? Yes, it is he. And I hope that in accordance with what we settled... I am entirely at your service, my lord. What is it to me, whether I know or not, what causes brought you hither, and why you wish to live in seclusion in my house? A landlord takes his money, and lets his guests do as they think best. Wait well. 
it is true, has told me that you wish to observe the stranger a little, who has been staying here for a few weeks with his young wife. But I hope that you will not cause him any annoyance. You would bring my house into ill repute, and certain people would fear to stop here. Men like us must live on people of all kinds. Do not fear. Only conduct me to the room which Waywill has ordered for me. I come here for an honorable purpose. I have no wish to know your secrets, my lord. Curiosity is by no means a fault of mine. I might, for instance, have known long ago who the stranger is, on whom you want to keep a watch. But I have no wish to know. This much, however, I have discovered, that he must have eloped with the young lady. The poor little wife, or whatever she may be, remains the whole day locked up in her room, and cries. And cries? Yes, and cries. But, my lord, why do your tears fall? The young lady must interest you deeply. Surely you are not. Do not detain him any longer. Come, come. One wall only will separate you from the lady in whom you are so much interested, and who may be. You mean, then, at any cost to know who? No, wait well. I have no wish to know anything. Make haste, then, before the whole house begins to stir. Will you please follow me, then, my lord? Exeunt. Scene 3. Meliphant's Room. Meliphant in dressing gown, sitting in an easy chair. Another night in which I could not have spent more cruelly on the rack. Norton! I must make haste to get sight of a face or two. If I remain alone with my thoughts any longer, they might carry me too far. Hey, Norton! He is still asleep. But is it not cruel of me not to let the poor devil sleep? How happy he is! However, I do not wish anyone about me to be happy. Norton! Norton, coming. Sir? Dress me. Oh, no sour looks, please. When I shall be able to sleep longer myself, I will let you do the same. If you wish to do your duty, at least have pity on me. Pity, sir? Pity on you? I know better where pity is due. And where then? Ah, uh, let me dress you and don't ask. Confound it! Are your reproofs then to awaken together with my conscience? I understand you. I know on whom you expend your pity. But I will do justice to her and to myself. Quite right. Do not have any pity on me. Curse me in your heart, but curse yourself also. Myself also? Yes, because you serve a miserable wretch whom earth ought not to bear, and because you have made yourself a partaker in his crimes. I made myself a partaker in your crimes? In what way? By keeping silent about them. Well, that is good. A word would have cost me my neck in the heat of your passions. And besides, did I not find you already so bad when I made your acquaintance that all hope of amendment was vain? What a life I have seen you leading from the first moment, in the lowest society of gamblers and vagrants. I call them what they were without regard to their knightly titles and such like. In this society you squandered a fortune which might have made a way for you to an honourable position, and your culpable intercourse with all sorts of women, especially with the wicked Marwood. Restore me. Restore me to that life. It was virtue compared with the present one. I spend my fortune. Well, the punishment follows, and I shall soon enough feel all the severity and humiliation of want. I associated with vicious women. That may be. I was myself seduced more often than I seduced others, and those whom I did seduce wished it. But I still had no ruined virtue upon my conscience. I had carried off no Sarah from the house of a beloved father, and forced her to follow a scoundrel who was no longer free. I had... Who comes so early to me? Scene 4 It is Betty. Up already, Betty? How is your mistress? <laughs> How is she? Oh, it was long after midnight before I could persuade her to go to bed. She slept a few moments, but God, what a sleep that must have been. She started suddenly, sprang up, and fell into my arms like one pursued by a murderer. She trembled, 
and a cold perspiration started on her pale face. I did all I could to calm her, but up to this morning she has only answered me with silent tears. <laughs> At length she sent me several times to your door to listen whether you were up. She wishes to speak to you. You alone can comfort her. Oh, do so, dearest sir, do so. My heart will break if she continues to fret like this. Go, Betty. Tell her I shall be with her in a moment. No, she wishes to come to you herself. Well, tell her then that I am awaiting her. Exit Betty. Scene 5. Oh, God, the poor young lady. Whose feelings is this exclamation of yours meant to rouse? See, the first tear which I have shed since my childhood is running down my cheek. A bad preparation for receiving one who seeks comfort. But why does she seek it from me? Yet where else shall she seek it? I must collect myself. Drying his eyes. Where is the old firmness with which I could see a beautiful eye in tears? Where is the gift of dissimulation gone by which I could be and could say whatsoever I wished? She will come now and weep tears that brook no resistance. Confused and ashamed, I shall stand before her. Like a convicted criminal, I shall stand before her. Counsel me, what shall I do? What shall I say? You shall do what she asks of you. I shall then perpetrate a fresh act of cruelty against her. She is wrong to blame me for delaying a ceremony which cannot be performed in this country without the greatest injury to us. Well, leave it, then. Why do we delay? Why do you let one day after the other pass, and one week after the other? Just give me the order, and you will be safe on board to-morrow. Perhaps her grief will not follow her over the ocean. She may leave part of it behind, and in another land may... I hope that myself. Silence! She is coming! How my heart throbs! Scene 6 Melophant, advancing towards her. You have had a restless night, dearest Sarah. Alas, Melifont, if it were nothing but a restless night. Melifont, to his servant. Leave us. Norton, aside, in going. I would not stay if I was paid in gold for every moment. Scene 7 You are faint, dear Sarah. You must sit down. Sarah sits down. I trouble you very early. Will you forgive me that with the morning I again begin my complaints? Dearest Sarah, you mean to say that you cannot forgive me, because another morning has dawned, and I have not yet put an end to your complaints? What is there that I would not forgive you? You know what I have already forgiven you. But the ninth week, Melifont, the ninth week begins today, and this miserable house still sees me in just the same position as on the first day. You doubt my love? I doubt your love? No. I feel my misery too much, too much to wish to deprive myself of this last and only solace. How, then, can you be uneasy about the delay of a ceremony? Ah, Melifont, why is it that we think so differently about this ceremony? Yield a little to the woman's way of thinking. I imagine it in a more direct consent from heaven. In vain did I try again, only yesterday in the long, tedious evening, to adopt your ideas— and to banish from my breast the doubt which just now, not for the first time, you have deemed the result of my distrust. I struggled with myself. I was clever enough to deafen my understanding. But my heart and my feeling quickly overthrew this toilsome structure of reason. Reproachful voices roused me from my sleep, and my imagination united with them to torment me. What pictures! What dreadful pictures hovered about me! I would willingly believe them to be dreams. What? Could my sensible Sarah believe them to be anything else? Dreams, my dearest dreams! How unhappy is man! Did not his Creator find torches enough for him in the realm of reality? Had he also to create in him the still more spacious realm of imagination in order to increase them? Do not accuse heaven! It has left the imagination in our power. She is guided by our acts, and when these are in accordance with our duties and with virtue, 
the imagination serves only to increase our peace and happiness. A single act, Meliphant, a single blessing bestowed upon us by a messenger of peace, in the name of the Eternal One, can restore my shattered imagination again. Do you still hesitate to do a few days sooner for love of me, what in any case you mean to do at some future time? Have pity on me, and consider that, although by this you may be freeing me only from torments of the imagination, yet these imagined torments are torments, and are real torments for her who feels them. Ah, oh, could I but tell you the terrors of the last night half as vividly as I have felt them! Wearied with crying and grieving, my only occupations, I sank down on my bed with half-closed eyes. Sly nature wished to recover itself a moment, to collect new tears. But hardly asleep yet, I suddenly saw myself on the steepest peak of a terrible rock. You went on before, and I followed with tottering, anxious steps, strengthened now and then by a glance which you threw back upon me. Suddenly I heard behind me a gentle call, which bade me stop. It was my father's voice. I am happy one. Can I forget nothing which is his? Alas, if his memory renders him equally cruel service, if he too cannot forget me. But he has forgotten me. Comfort, cruel comfort for his Sarah. But listen, Meliphant. In turning round to this well-known voice, my foot slipped. I reeled and was on the point of falling down the precipice, when just in time I felt myself held back by one who resembled myself. I was just returning her my passionate thanks when she drew a dagger from her bosom. I saved you, she cried, to ruin you. She lifted her armed hand and I awoke with the blow. Awake, I still felt all the pain which a mortal stab must give without the pleasure which it brings, the hope for the end of grief in the end of life. Ah, dearest Sarah, I promise you the end of your grief without the end of your life, which would certainly be the end of mine also. Forget the terrible tissue of a meaningless dream. I look to you for the strength to be able to forget it. Be it love or seduction, happiness or unhappiness which threw me into your arms, I am yours in my heart and will remain so forever. But I am not yet yours in the eyes of that judge who has threatened to punish the smallest transgressions of his law. Then may all the punishment fall upon me alone. What can fall upon you without touching me, too? But do not misinterpret my urgent request. Another woman, after having forfeited her honor by an error like mine, might perhaps only seek to regain a part of it by a legal union. I do not think of that, Meliphant, because I do not wish to know of any other honor in this world than that of loving you— I do not wish to be united to you for the world's sake, but for my own, and I will willingly bear the shame of not appearing to be so when I am united to you. You need not, then, if you do not wish, acknowledge me to be your wife. You may call me what you will. I will not bear your name. You shall keep our union as secret as you think good, and may I always be unworthy of it if I ever harbor the thought of drawing any other advantage from it than the appeasing of my conscience." Stop, Sarah, or I shall die before your eyes. How wretched I am that I have not the courage to make you more wretched still. Consider that you have given yourself up to my guidance. Consider that it is my duty to look to our future, and that I must at present be deaf to your complaints if I will not hear you utter more grievous complaints throughout the rest of your life. Have you then forgotten what I have so often represented to you in justification of my conduct? I have not forgotten it, Meliphant. You wish first to secure a certain bequest. You wish first to secure some temporal goods, and you let me forfeit eternal ones, perhaps, through it. Ah, Sarah, if you were as certain of all temporal goods as your virtue is of the eternal ones. My virtue? Do not say that word. Once it sounded sweet to me, but now a terrible thunder rolls in it. What? Must he who is to be virtuous never have committed a trespass? Has a single error such fatal effect that it can annihilate a whole course of blameless years? If so, no one is virtuous. Virtue is then a chimera, which disperses in the air when one thinks that one grasps it most firmly. 
If so, there is no wise being who suits our duties to our strength. If so, there is... I am frightened at the terrible conclusions in which your despondency must involve me. No, Sarah, you are still the virtuous Sarah that you were before your unfortunate acquaintance with me. If you look upon yourself with such cruel eyes, with what eyes must you regard me? With the eyes of love, Melifont. I implore you, then, on my knees I implore you, for the sake of this love, this generous love, which overlooks all my unworthiness, to calm yourself. Have patience for a few days longer. A few days? How long even a single day is? Cursed bequest! Cursed nonsense of a dying cousin who would only leave me his fortune on the condition that I should give my hand to a relation who hates me as much as I hate her. To you, inhuman tyrants of our freedom, be imputed all the misfortune, all the sin, into which your compulsion forces us. Could I but dispense with this degrading inheritance? As long as my father's fortune sufficed for my maintenance, I always scorned it, and did not even think it worthy of mentioning. But now, now when I should like to possess all the treasures of the world— only to lay them at the feet of my Sarah, now, when I must contrive at least to let her appear in the world as befits her station, now I must have recourse to it. Which probably will not be successful after all. You always forbode the worst. No, the lady whom this also concerns is not disinclined to enter into a sort of agreement with me. The fortune is to be divided and as she cannot enjoy the whole with me, she is willing to let me buy my liberty with half of it. I am every hour expecting the final intelligence, the delay of which alone has so prolonged our sojourn here. As soon as I receive it, we shall not remain here one moment longer. We will immediately cross to France, dear Sarah, where you shall find new friends, who already look forward to the pleasure of seeing and loving you, and these new friends shall be the witnesses of our union." They shall be the witnesses of our union. Cruel man! Our union, then, is not to be in my native land? I shall leave my country as a criminal? And as such, you think, I should have the courage to trust myself to the ocean. The heart of him must be calmer or more impious than mine, who, only for a moment, can see with indifference between himself and destruction nothing but a quavering plank— Death would roar at me in every wave that struck against the vessel. Every wind would howl its curses after me from my native shore, and the slightest storm would seem a sentence of death pronounced upon me. No, Melifont, you cannot be so cruel to me. If I live to see the completion of this agreement, you must not grudge another day to be spent here. This must be the day on which you shall teach me to forget the tortures of all these tearful days— this must be the sacred day. Alas, which day will it be? But do you consider, Sarah, that our marriage here would lack those ceremonies which are due to it? A sacred act does not acquire more force through ceremonies. But... I am astonished. You surely will not insist on such a trivial pretext. Oh, Melifont, Melifont, had I not made for myself an inviolable law never to doubt the sincerity of your love... This circumstance might. But too much of this already. It might seem as if I had been doubting it even now. The first moment of your doubt would be the last moment of my life. Alas, Sarah, what have I done, that you should remind me even of the possibility of it? It is true the confessions, which I have made to you without fear, of my early excesses cannot do me honour, but they should at least awaken confidence. A coquettish ma would hold me in her meshes, because I felt for her that which is so often taken for love, which it so rarely is. I should still bear her shameful fetters, had not heaven, which perhaps did not think my heart quite unworthy to burn with better flames, taken pity on me. To see you, dearest Sarah, was to forget all Marwoods. But how dearly have you paid for taking me out of such hands! I had grown too familiar with vice, and you know it too little. Let us think no more of it. Scene 8 What do you want? While I was standing before the house, a servant gave me this letter. It is directed to you, sir. To me? Who knows my name here? Looking at the letter. Good heavens! 
You are startled. But without cause, Sarah, as I now perceive, I was mistaken in the handwriting. May the contents be as agreeable to you as you can wish. I suspect they will be of very little importance. One is less constrained when one is alone, so allow me to retire to my room again. You entertain suspicions, then, about it? Not at all, Meliphant. Meliphant, going with her to the back of the stage. I shall be with you in a moment, dearest Sarah. Scene 9. Meliphant, still looking at the letter. Just heaven! Woe to you if it is only just. Is it possible? I see this cursed handwriting again, and am not chilled with terror. Is it she? Is it not she? Why do I still doubt? It is she. Alas, friend, a letter from Marwood. What fury, what demon has betrayed my abode to her? What does she still want from me? Go, make preparations immediately that we may get away from here. Yet stop. Perhaps it is unnecessary. Perhaps the contempt of my farewell letters has only caused Marwood to reply with equal contempt. There, open the letter, read it. I am afraid to do so myself. Norton. Reads. If you will deign, Meliphant, to glance at the name which you will find at the bottom of the page, it will be to me as though I had written you the longest of letters. Curse the name! Would I had never heard it! Would it could be erased from the book of the living! Norton. Reads on. The labour of finding you out has been sweetened by the love which helped me in my search. Love? Wanton creature, you profane the words which belong to virtue alone. Norton continues. Love has done more still. I tremble. It has brought me to you. Traitor, what are you reading? Snatches the letter from his hand and reads himself. I am here, and at rest with you, whether you will await a visit from me, or whether you will anticipate mine by one from you. Marwood. What a thunderbolt! She is here. Where is she? She shall atone for this audacity with her life. With her life? One glance from her, and she will be again at her feet. Take care what you do. You must not speak with her, or the misfortunes of your poor young lady will be complete. Oh, wretched man that I am. No, I must speak with her. She would go even into Sarah's room in search of me, and would vent all her rage on that innocent girl. But, sir... Not a word. Let me see whether she has given the address. Looking at the letter. Here it is. Come, show me the way. Exeunt. End of Act One. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Act 2 of Miss Sarah Sampson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miss Sarah Sampson, A Tragedy in Five Acts, by G. E. Lessing. Act Two. Scene One. Marwood's Room in Another Inn. Marwood in Negligee, and Hannah. I hope Belfort has delivered the letter at the right address, Hannah. He has. To him himself? To his servant. I am all impatient to see what effect it will have. Do I not seem a little uneasy to you, Hannah? And I am so. The traitor. But gently, I must not on any account give way to anger. Forbearance, love, entreaty are the only weapons which I can use against him, if I rightly understand his weak side. But if he should harden himself against them? If he should harden himself against them? Then I shall not be angry. I shall rave. I feel it, Hannah, and I would rather do so to begin with. Calm yourself. He may come at any moment. I only hope he may come. I only hope he has not decided to await me on his own ground. 
But do you know, Hannah, on what I chiefly found my hopes of drawing away the faithless man from this new object of his love? On our Bella. It is true she is a little idle to him, and there could not have been a happier idea than that of bringing her with you. Even if his heart should be deaf to an old love, the language of blood will at least be audible to him. He tore the child from my arms a short time ago under the pretext of wishing to give her an education such as she could not have with me. It is only by an artifice that I have been able to get her again from the lady who had charge of her. He had paid more than a year in advance, and had given strict orders the very day before his flight that they should by no means give admission to a certain Marwood, who would perhaps come and give herself out as the mother of the child. From this order I see the distinction which he draws between us. He regards Arabella as a precious portion of himself, and me as an unfortunate creature of whose charms he has grown weary. What ingratitude! Ah, Hannah, nothing more infallibly draws down ingratitude than favours for which no gratitude would be too great. Why have I shown him this fatal favours? Ought I not to have foreseen that they could not always retain their value with him, that their value rested on the difficulty in the way of their enjoyment, and the latter must disappear with the charm of our looks, which the hand of time imperceptibly but surely effaces? You, madam, have not anything to fear for a long time from this dangerous hand. To my mind, your beauty is so far from having passed the point of its brightest bloom that it is rather advancing towards it, and would enchain fresh hearts for you every day if you only would give it the permission. Be silent, Hannah. You flatter me on an occasion which makes me suspicious of any flattery. It is nonsense to speak of new conquests if one has not even sufficient power to retain possession of those which one has already made. Scene two. Someone wishes to have the honor of speaking with you. Who is it? I suppose it is the gentleman to whom the letter was addressed. At least the servant to whom I delivered it is with him. Melifont. Quick, bring him up. Exit servant. Ah, Hannah, he is here now. How shall I receive him? What shall I say? What look shall I put on? Is this calm enough? Just see. Anything but calm. This, then? Throw a little sweetness into it. So, perhaps? Too sad. Would this smile do? Perfectly, only less constrained. He is coming. Scene three. Melifont, entering with wild gestures. Ah, oh, Marwood. Marwood, running to meet him, smiling and with open arms. Ah, Melifont. Melifont, aside. A murderess. What a look! I must embrace you, faithless, dear fugitive. Share my joy with me. Why do you tear yourself from my caresses? I expected, Marwood, that you would receive me differently. Why differently? With more love, perhaps? With more delight? Alas, how unhappy I am that I cannot express all that I feel— do you not see, Melifont? Do you not see that joy, too, has its tears? Here they fall, the offspring of sweetest delight. But alas, vain tears, his hand does not dry you. Marwood, the time is gone when such words would have charmed me. You must speak now with me in another tone. I come to hear your last reproaches and to answer them. Reproaches? What reproaches should I have for you, Melifont? None. Then you might have spared yourself the journey, I should think. Dearest capricious heart, why will you forcibly compel me to recall a trifle which I forgave you the same moment I heard of it? Does a passing infidelity which your gallantry, but not your heart, has caused, deserve these reproaches? Come, let us laugh at it. You are mistaken. My heart is more concerned in it than it ever was in all our love affairs, upon which I cannot look back now but with disgust. Your heart, Melifont, is a good little fool. It lets your imagination persuade it to whatever it will. Believe me, I know it better than you do yourself. Were it not the best, the most faithful of hearts, should I take such pains to keep it? To keep it? You never possessed it, I tell you. And I tell you that in reality I possess it still. Marwood, 
If I knew that you still possessed one single fibre of it, I would tear it out of my breast here before your eyes. You would see that you were tearing mine out at the same time. And then, then these hearts would at last attain that union which they have sought so often upon our lips. Maliphant, aside. What a serpent! Flight will be the best thing here. Just tell me briefly, Marwood, why you have followed me, and what you still desire of me. But tell it me without this smile, without this look, in which a whole hell of seduction lurks and terrifies me. Just listen, my dear Melifont. I see your position now. Your desires and your taste are at present your tyrants. Never mind, one must let them wear themselves out. It is folly to resist them. They are most safely lulled to sleep, and at last even conquered, by giving them free scope. They wear themselves away. Can you accuse me, my fickle friend, of ever having been jealous when more powerful charms than mine estranged you from me for a time? I never grudged you the change by which I always won more than I lost. You returned with new ardor, with new passion to my arms, in which with light bonds and never with heavy fetters I encompassed you. Have I not often even been your confidant, though you had nothing to confide but the favors which you stole from me in order to lavish them on others? Why should you believe, then, that I would now begin to display a capriciousness just when I am seizing, or perhaps have already seized, to be justified in it? If your ardor for the pretty country girl has not yet cooled down, if you are still in the first fever of your love for her, if you cannot yet do without the enjoyment she gives you, who hinders you from devoting yourself to her as long as you think good? But must you on that account make such rash projects and purpose to fly from the country with her? Marwood, you speak in perfect keeping with your character, the wickedness of which I had never understood so well as I do now, since in the society of a virtuous woman I have learned to distinguish love from licentiousness. Indeed. Your new mistress is then a girl of fine moral sentiments, I suppose. You men surely cannot know yourselves what you want. At one time you are pleased with the most wanton talk and the most unchaste jests from us. At another time we charm you when we talk nothing but virtue and seem to have all the seven sages on our lips. But the worst is that you get tired of one as much as the other. We may be foolish or reasonable, worldly or spiritual. Our efforts to make you constant are lost either way. The turn will come to your beautiful saint soon enough. Shall I give you a little sketch? Just at present you are in the most passionate paroxysm over her. I allow this two or at the most three days more. To this will succeed a tolerably calm love. For this I allow a week. The next week you will only think occasionally of this love. In the third week you will have to be reminded of it. And when you have got tired of being thus reminded, you will so quickly see yourself reduced to the most utter indifference that I can hardly allow the fourth week for this final change. This would be about a month altogether. And this month, Melifont, I will overlook with the greatest pleasure, but you will allow that I must not lose sight of you. You try all the weapons in vain which you remember to have used successfully with me in bygone days. A virtuous resolution secures me against both your tenderness and your wit. However, I will not expose myself longer to either. I go, and have nothing more to tell you but that in a few days you shall know that I am bound in such a manner as will utterly destroy all your hope of my ever returning into your sinful slavery. You will have learnt my justification sufficiently from the letter which I sent to you before my departure. It is well that you mention this letter. Tell me, who did you get to write it? Did not I write it myself? Impossible. The beginning of it, in which you reckoned up, I do not know what sums, which you say you have wasted with me, must have been written by an innkeeper, and the theological part at the end by a Quaker. I will now give you a serious reply to it. 
as to the principal point, you well know that all the presents which you have made are still in existence. I have never considered your checks or your jewels as my property, and I have brought them all with me to return them into the hands which entrusted them to me. Keep them all, Marwood. I will not keep any of them. What right have I to them without you yourself? Although you do not love me any more, you must at least do me justice, and not take me for one of those venal females, to whom it is a matter of indifference by whose booty they enrich themselves. Come, Melifont, you shall this moment be as rich again as you perhaps might still be if you had not known me, and perhaps, too, might not be. What demon intent upon my destruction speaks through you now? Voluptuous Marwood does not think so nobly. Do you call that noble? I call it only just. No, sir, no, I do not ask that you shall account the return of your gifts as anything remarkable. It costs me nothing, and I should even consider the slightest expression of thanks on your part as an insult, which could have no other meaning than this. Marwood, I thought you a base deceiver. I am thankful that you have not wished to be so towards me, at least. Enough, madam, enough. I fly, since my unlucky destiny threatens to involve me in a contest of generosity in which I would be most unwilling to succumb. Fly, then, but take everything with you that could remind me of you. Poor, despised, without honour and without friends, I will then venture again to awaken your pity. I will show you in the unfortunate Marwood only a miserable woman who has sacrificed to you her person, her honour, her virtue, and her conscience. I will remind you of the first day when you saw and loved me, of the first stammering, bashful confession of your love, which you made me at my feet, of the first assurance of my return of your love, which you forced from me, of the tender looks, of the passionate embraces which followed, of the eloquent silence when each with busy mind divined the other's most secret feelings and read the most hidden thoughts of the soul in the languishing eye, of the trembling expectation of approaching gratification, of the intoxication of its joys, of the sweet relaxation after the fullness of enjoyment in which the exhausted spirits regain strength for fresh delights. I shall remind you of all this and then embrace your knees, and entreat without ceasing for the only gift which you cannot deny me, and which I can accept without blushing, for death from your hand. Cruel one, I will still even give my life for you. Ask it, ask it, only do not any longer claim my love. I must leave you, Marwood, or make myself an object of loathing to the whole world. I am culpable enough already in that I only stand here and listen to you. Farewell, farewell. Marwood, holding him back. You must leave me? And what then do you wish shall become of me? As I am now, I am your creature. Do then what becomes a creator. He may not withdraw his hand from the work until he wishes to destroy it utterly. Alas, Hannah, I see now my entreaties alone are too feeble. Go, bring my intercessor, who will now, perhaps, return to me more than she ever received from me. Exit Hannah. What intercessor, Marwood? Ah, an intercessor of whom you would only too willingly have deprived me. Nature will take a shorter route to your heart with her grievances. You alarm me. Surely you have not. Scene 4 What do I see? It is she. Marwood, how could you dare to? Am I not her mother? Come, my Bella, see, here is your protector again, your friend, your... Ah, his heart may tell him what more he can be to you than a protector and a friend. Melifont, turning away his face. God, what shall I have to suffer here? Arabella, advancing timidly towards him. Ah, sir, is it you? Are you our Melifont? No, madame, surely. Surely it is not he. Would he not look at me, if it were? Would he not hold me in his arms? He used to do so. What an unhappy child I am. How have I grieved him, this dear, dear man, who let me call him my father? 
You are silent, Melifont. You grudge the innocent child a single look. Oh. Why, he sighs, madame. What is the matter with him? Cannot we help him? Cannot I? Nor you? Then let us sigh with him. Ah, now he looks at me. No, he looks away again. He looks up to heaven. What does he want? What does he ask from heaven? Would that heaven would grant him everything, even if it refused me everything for it. Go, my child, go. Fall at his feet. He wants to leave us, to leave us forever. Arabella, falling on her knees before him. Here I am already. You will leave us? You will leave us forever? Have not we already been without you for a little... Forever? Shall we have to lose you again? You have said so often that you loved us. Does one leave the people whom one loves? I cannot love you then, I suppose. For I should wish never to leave you. Never. And I will never leave you either. I will help you in your entreaties, my child. And you must help me too. Now, Melifont, you see me too at your feet. Melifont, stopping her as she throws herself at his feet. Marwood, dangerous Marwood, and you too, my dearest Bella. Raising her up. You too are the enemy of your Melifont? I your enemy? What is your resolve? What it ought not to be, Marwood, what it ought not to be. Marwood, embracing him. Ah, I know that the honesty of your heart has always overcome the obstinacy of your desires. Do not importune me any longer. I am already what you wish to make me, a perjurer, a seducer, a robber, a murderer. You will be so in imagination for a few days, and after that you will see that I have prevented you from becoming so in reality. You will return with us, won't you? Oh, yes. Do. Return with you? How can I? Nothing is easier if you only wish it. And my Sarah? And your Sarah may look to herself. Ah, cruel Marwood, these words reveal the very bottom of your heart to me. And yet I, wretch, do not repent. If you had seen the bottom of my heart, you would have discovered that it has more true pity for your Sarah than you yourself have. I say true pity, for your pity is egotistic and weak. You have carried this love affair much too far. We might let it pass that you, as a man, who by long intercourse with our sex has become master in the art of seducing, used your superiority in this simulation and experience against such a young maiden, and did not rest until you had gained your end. You can plead the impetuosity of your passion as your excuse. But, Melifont, you cannot justify yourself for having robbed an old father of his only child, for having rendered to an honourable old man his few remaining steps to the grave harder and more bitter, for having broken the strongest ties of nature for the sake of your desires. Repair your error, then, as far as it is possible to repair it. Give the old man his support again, and send a credulous daughter back to her home, which you need not render desolate also, because you have dishonoured it. This only was still wanting, that you should call in my conscience against me also. But even supposing what you say were just, must I not be brazen-faced, if I should propose it myself to the unhappy girl? Well, I will confess to you that I have anticipated this difficulty, and considered how to spare you it. As soon as I learned your address, I informed her old father privately of it. He was beside himself with joy, and wanted to start directly. I wonder he has not yet arrived. What do you say? Just await his arrival quietly, and do not let the girl notice anything. I myself will not detain you any longer. Go to her again, she might grow suspicious. But I trust that I shall see you again today. Oh, Marwood, with what feelings did I come to you, and with what must I leave you? A kiss, my dear Bella. That was for you, now one for me. But come back again soon. Do. Exit Maliphant. Scene 5. Marwood, drawing a deep breath. Ah, oh, victory, Hannah, but a hard victory. Give me a chair, I feel quite exhausted. Sitting down. 
He surrendered only just in time. If he had hesitated another moment, I should have shown him quite a different Marwood. Ah, madam, what a woman you are! I should like to be the man who could resist you. He has resisted me already too long. And assuredly, assuredly I will not forgive him that he almost let me go down on my knees to him. No, no. You must forgive him everything. He is so good, so good. Be silent, little silly. I do not know on what side you did not attack him, but nothing, I think, touched him more than the disinterestedness with which you offered to return all his presents to him. I believe so, too. <laughs> Why do you laugh, madam? You really risked a great deal if you were not in earnest about it. Suppose he had taken you at your word. Oh, nonsense. One knows with whom one has to deal. I quite admit that. But you, too, my pretty Bella, did your part excellently. Excellently. How so? Could I do it, then, any other way? I had not seen him for such a long time. I hope you are not angry, madame, that I love him so. I love you as much as him, just as much. Very well. I will pardon you this time that you do not love me better than him. <laughs> th th this time? Why? Are you crying, actually? What is it about? Ah, uh, no. I am not crying. Do not get angry. I will love you both so much, so much, that it will be impossible to love either of you more. Very well. I am so unhappy. Now be quiet. But what is that? Scene 6 Why do you come back again so soon, Melifont? Rising because I needed but a few moments to recover my senses. Well? I was stunned, Marwood, but not moved. You have had all your trouble in vain. Another atmosphere than this infectious one of your room has given me back my courage and my strength to withdraw my foot in time from this dangerous snare. Were the tricks of a Marwood not sufficiently familiar to me, unworthy wretch that I am? What language is that? The language of truth and anger. Gently, Melifont, or I too shall speak in the same language. I return only in order not to leave you one moment longer under a delusion in regard to me, which must make me despicable even in your eyes. Oh, Hannah! Look at me as madly as you like. The more madly the better. Was it possible that I could hesitate only for one moment between a Marwood and a Sarah, and that I have well nigh decided for the former? Oh, Melifont! Do not tremble, Bella. For your sake, too, I came back. Give me your hand, and follow me without fear. Marwood, stopping them. Whom shall she follow, traitor? Her father. Go, pitiable wretch, and learn first to know her mother. I know her. She is a disgrace to her sex. Take her away, Hannah. Remain here, Bella. Attempting to stop her. No force, Melifont, or... Exeunt Hannah and Arabella. Scene 7. Now we are alone. Say now once more whether you are determined to sacrifice me for a foolish girl. Sacrifice you? You recall to my mind that impure animals were also sacrificed to the ancient gods. Express yourself without these learned allusions. I tell you then that I am firmly resolved never to think of you again, but with the most fearful of curses. Who are you, and who is Sarah? You are a voluptuous, egoistic, shameful strumpet, who certainly can scarcely remember any longer that she ever was innocent. I have nothing to reproach myself with, but that I have enjoyed myself with you, that which otherwise you would perhaps have let the whole world enjoy. You have sought me, not I, you, and if I now know who Marwood is, I have paid for this knowledge dearly enough. It has cost me my fortune, my honour, my happiness. And I would that it might also cost you your eternal happiness. Monster! Is the devil worse than you when he lures feeble mortals into crimes and himself accuses them afterwards for these crimes which are his own work? What is my innocence to you? What does it matter to you when and how I lost it? If I could not sacrifice my virtue, I have at least staked my good name for you. The former is no more valuable than the latter. 
Uh, what do I say? More valuable? Without it, the former is a silly fancy which brings one neither happiness nor guilt. The good name alone gives it some value and can exist quite well without it. What did it matter what I was before I knew you, you wretch? It is enough that in the eyes of the world I was a woman without reproach. Through you only it has learned that I am not so, solely through my readiness to accept your heart, as I then thought, without your hand. This very readiness condemns you, vile woman. But do you remember to what base tricks you owed it? Was I not persuaded by you that you could not be publicly united to me without forfeiting an inheritance which you wished to share with me only? Is it time now to renounce it? And to renounce it not for me, but for another? It is a real delight to me to be able to tell you that this difficulty will soon be removed. Content yourself, therefore, with having deprived me of my father's inheritance, and let me enjoy a far smaller one with a more worthy wife. Ha! Now I see what it is that makes you so perverse. Well, I will lose no more words. Be it so. Be assured I shall do everything to forget you. And the first thing that I will do to this end shall be this. You will understand me. Tremble for your Bella. Her life shall not carry the memory of my despised love down to posterity. My cruelty shall do it. Behold in me a new Medea. Marwood. Or, if you know a more cruel mother still, behold her cruelty doubled in me. Poison and dagger shall avenge me. But no, poison and dagger are tools too merciful for me. They would kill your child and mine too soon. I will not see it dead. I will see it dying. I will see each feature of the face which she has from you, disfigured, distorted, and obliterated by slow torture. With eager hand will I part limb from limb, vein from vein, nerve from nerve, and will not cease to cut and burn the very smallest of them, even when there is nothing remaining but a senseless carcass. Aye, I shall at least feel in it how sweet is revenge. You are raving, Marwood. You remind me that my ravings are not directed against the right person. The father must go first. He must already be in yonder world when, through a thousand woes, the spirit of his daughter follows him. She advances towards him with a dagger which she draws from her bosom. So die, traitor! Melifont, seizing her arm and snatching the dagger from her. Insane woman! What hinders me now from turning the steel against you? But live, and your punishment shall be left for a hand void of honour. Marwood, wringing her hands. Heaven, what have I done? Melifont. Your grief shall not deceive me. I know well why you are sorry. Not that you wish to stab me, but that you failed to do so. Give me back the erring steel. Give it me back, and you shall see for whom it was sharpened. For this breast alone, which for long has been too narrow for a heart, which will rather renounce life than your love. Hannah! What are you doing, Melifont? Scene 8 Did you hear, Hannah, how madly your mistress was behaving? Remember that I shall hold you responsible for Arabella. Madam, how agitated you are! I will place the innocent child in safety immediately. Justice will no doubt be able to bind the murderous hands of her cruel mother. Going. Whither, Melifont? Is it astonishing that the violence of my grief deprived me of any reason? Who forces me to such unnatural excess? Is it not you yourself? Where can Bella be safer than with me? My lips may rave, but my heart still remains the heart of a mother. Oh, Melifont, forget my madness, and to excuse I think only of its cause. There is only one thing which can induce me to forget it. And that is? That you return immediately to London. I will send Arabella there under another escort. You must by no means have anything further to do with her. Very well. I submit to everything, but grant me one single request more. Let me see your Sarah once. And what for? To read in her eyes my future fate. I will judge for myself whether she is worthy of such a breach of faith as you commit against me, 
and whether I may cherish the hope of receiving again, some day at any rate, a portion of your love. Vain hope. Who is so cruel as to grudge even hope to the unhappy? I will not show myself to her as Marwood, but uh, as a relation of yours. Announce me to her as such. You shall be present when I call upon her, and I promise you, by all that is sacred, to say nothing that is in any way displeasing to her. Do not refuse my request, for otherwise I might perhaps do all that is in my power to show myself to her in my true character. Marwood, this request, after a moment's reflection. Might be granted. But will you then be sure to quit this spot? Certainly, yes, I promise you. Even more, I will spare you the visit from her father, if that is still possible. There is no need of that. I hope he will include me too in the pardon which he grants to his daughter. But if he will not pardon her, I too shall know how to deal with him. I will go and announce you to my Sarah. Only keep your promise, Marwood. Exit. Alas, Hannah, that our powers are not as great as our courage. Come, help me to dress. I do not despair of my scheme. If I could only make sure of him first. Come. End of Act Two Act Three of Miss Sarah Sampson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miss Sarah Sampson, A Tragedy in Five Acts by G. E. Lessing. Act Three. Scene One. A Room in the First Inn. There we will. Take this letter to her. It is the letter of an affectionate father, who complains of nothing but her absence. Tell her that I have sent you on before with it, and that I only await her answer, to come myself and fold her again in my arms. I think you do well to prepare them for your arrival in this way. I make sure of her intentions by this means, and give her the opportunity of freeing herself from any shame or sorrow which repentance might cause her, before she speaks verbally with me. In a letter it will cost her less embarrassment, and me, perhaps, fewer tears. But may I ask, sir, what have you resolved upon with regard to Melifont? Ah, wait well. If I could separate him from my daughter's lover... I should make some very harsh resolve. But as this cannot be, you see, he is saved from my anger. I myself am most to blame in this misfortune, but for me Sarah never would have made the acquaintance of this dangerous man. I admitted him freely into my house on account of an obligation under which I believe myself to be to him. It was natural that the attention which in gratitude I paid him should win for him the esteem of my daughter. It was just as natural that a man of his disposition should suffer himself to be tempted by this esteem to something more. He had been clever enough to transform it into love before I noticed anything at all, and before I had time to inquire into his former life. The evil was done, and I should have done well if I had forgiven them everything immediately. I wished to be inexorable towards him, and did not consider that I could not be so towards him alone. If I had spared my severity which came too late, I would have at least prevented their flight. But here I am now, Waitwell. I must fetch them back myself, and consider myself happy, if only I can make a son of a seducer. For who knows whether he will give up his Marwoods? and his other creatures for the sake of a girl who has left nothing for his desires to wish for, and who understands so little the bewitching arts of a coquette. Well, sir, it cannot be possible that a man could be so wicked. This doubt, good Waitwell, does honor to your virtue. But why, at the same time, is it true that the limits of human wickedness extend much further still? Go now and do as I told you. 
Notice every look as she reads my letter. In this short deviation from virtue, she cannot yet have learned the art of dissimulation, to the masks of which only deep-rooted vice can have recourse. You will read her whole soul in her face. Do not let a look escape you which might perhaps indicate indifference to me, disregard of her father. For if you should unhappily discover this, and if she loves me no more, I hope that I shall be able to conquer myself and abandon her to her fate. I hope so, Waitwell. Alas, would that there were no heart here to contradict this hope. Exeunt on different sides. Scene 2. Sarah's Room. I have done wrong, dearest Sarah, to leave you in uneasiness about the letter which came just now. Oh, dear, no, Melifont. I have not been in the least uneasy about it. Could you not love me even though you still had secrets from me? You think, then, that it was a secret? But not one which concerns me, and that must suffice for me. You are only too good. Let me nevertheless reveal my secret to you. The letter contained a few lines from a relative of mine who has heard of my being here. She passes through here on her way to London and would like to see me. She has begged at the same time to be allowed the honour of paying you a visit. It will always be a pleasure to me to make the acquaintance of the respected members of your family. But consider for yourself whether I can yet appear before one of them without blushing. Without blushing? And for what? For your love to me? It is true, Sarah, you could have given your love to a nobler or a richer man. You must be ashamed that you were content to give your heart for another heart only, and that in this exchange you lost sight of your happiness. You must know yourself how wrongly you interpret my words. Pardon me, Sarah, if my interpretation is wrong. They can have no meaning at all. What is the name of your relation? She is uh, Lady Soames. You will have heard me mention the name before. I don't remember. May I beg you to see her? Beg me? You can command me to do so. What a word! No, Sarah, she shall not have the happiness of seeing you. She will regret it, but she must submit to it. Sarah has her reasons, which I respect without knowing them. How hasty you are, Melifont! I shall expect Lady Solmes, and do my best to show myself worthy of the honour of her visit. Are you content? Ah, Sarah, let me confess my ambition. I should like to show you to the whole world. And were I not proud of the possession of such a being, I should reproach myself with not being able to appreciate her value. I will go and bring her to you at once. Exit. I hope she will not be one of those proud women who are so full of their own virtue that they believe themselves above all failings. With one single look of contempt they condemn us, and an equivocal shrug of the shoulders is all the pity we seem to deserve in their eyes. Scene 3. Betty. Behind the scenes. Just come in here if you must speak to her yourself. Sarah. Looking around. Who must speak to me? Whom do I see? Is it possible? You, wait well. How happy I am to see our young lady again. Good God, what do you bring me? I hear already. I hear already. You bring me the news of my father's death. He is gone. The excellent man, the best of fathers. He is gone, and I, I am the miserable creature who has hastened his death. Ah, miss. Tell me, quick, tell me that his last moments were not embittered by the thought of me, that he had forgotten me, that he died as peacefully as he used to hope to die in my arms, that he did not remember me even in his last prayer. Pray do not torment yourself with such false notions. Your father is still alive. He is still alive, honest Sir William. Is he still alive? Is it true is he still alive? May he live a long while yet and live happily. Oh, would that God would add the half of my years to his life. Half? How ungrateful should I be if I were not willing to buy even a few moments for him with all the years that may yet be mine. But tell me at least, wait well, that it is not hard for him to live without me, that it was easy to him to renounce a daughter who could so easily renounce her virtue, that he is angry with me for my flight, but not grieved, that he curses me, but does not mourn for me. 
Ah, Sir William is still the same fond father, as his Sarah is still the same fond daughter that she was. What do you say? You are a messenger of evil, of the most dreadful of all the evils which my imagination has ever pictured to me. He is still the same fond father. Then he loves me still? And he must mourn for me then. No, no, he does not do so. He cannot do so. Do you not see how infinitely each sigh which he wasted on me would magnify my crime? Would not the justice of heaven have to charge me with every tear which I forced from him, as if with each one I repeated my vice and my ingratitude? I grow chill at the thought. I cause him tears? Tears? And they are other tears than tears of joy? Contradict me, Waitwell. At most he has felt some slight stirring of the blood on my account, some transitory emotion, calmed by a slight effort of reason. He did not go so far as to shed tears. Surely not to shed tears, Waitwell. Waitwell, wiping his eyes. No, miss, he did not go so far as that. Alas, your lips say no and your eyes say yes. Take this letter, miss. It is from him himself. From whom? From my father? To me? Yes, take it. You can learn more from it than I am able to say. He ought to have given this to another to do, not to me. I promised myself pleasure from it, but you turn my joy into sadness. Give it me, honest Waitwell. But no, I will not take it before you tell me what it contains. What can it contain? Love and forgiveness. Love? Forgiveness? And perhaps a real regret that he used the rights of a father's power against a child who should only have the privileges of a father's kindness. Then keep your cruel letter. Cruel? Have no fear. Full liberty is granted you over your heart and hand. And it is just this which I fear. To grieve a father such as he, this I have had the courage to do. But to see him forced by this very grief, by his love which I have forfeited, to look with leniency on all the wrong into which an unfortunate passion has led me, this, wait well, I could not bear. If his letter contained all the hard and angry words which an exasperated father can utter in such a case, I should read it. With a shudder, it is true. But still I should be able to read it. I should be able to produce a shadow of defense against his wrath, to make him by this defense, if possible, more angry still. My consolation then would be this, that melancholy grief could have no place with violent wrath, and that the latter would transform itself finally into bitter contempt. And we grieve no more for one whom we despise. My father would have grown calm again, and I would not have to reproach myself with having made him unhappy for ever. Alas, miss, you will have to reproach yourself still less for this if you now accept his love again, which wishes only to forget everything. You are mistaken, Waitwell. His yearning for me misleads him perhaps to give his consent to everything. But no sooner would this desire be appeased a little than he would feel ashamed before himself of his weakness. Sullen anger would take possession of him, and he would never be able to look at me without silently accusing me of all that I had dared to exact from him. Yes, if it were in my power to spare him his bitterest grief, when on my account he is laying the greatest restraint upon himself, if at a moment when he would grant me everything I could sacrifice all to him, then it would be quite a different matter. I would take the letter from your hands with pleasure— would admire in it the strength of the fatherly love, and, not to abuse this love, I would throw myself at his feet a repentant and obedient daughter. But can I do that? I shall be obliged to make use of his permission, regardless of the price this permission has cost him. And then, when I feel most happy, it will suddenly occur to me that he only outwardly appears to share my happiness, and that inwardly he is sighing. In short, that he has made me happy by the renunciation of his own happiness, and to wish to be happy in this way. Do you expect that of me, Waitwell? I truly do not know what answer to give to that. 
there is no answer to it. So take your letter back. If my father must be unhappy through me, I will myself remain unhappy also. To be quite alone in unhappiness is that for which I now pray heaven every hour. But to be quite alone in my happiness, of that I will not hear. Wait well. Aside. I really think I shall have to employ deception with this good child to get her to read the letter. What are you saying to yourself? I was saying to myself that the idea I had hit on to get you to read this letter all the quicker was a very clumsy one. How so? I could not look far enough. Of course you see more deeply into things than such as I. I did not wish to frighten you. The letter is perhaps only too hard. And when I said that it contained nothing but love and forgiveness, I ought to have said that I wished it might not contain anything else. Is that true? Give it to me, then. I will read it. If one has been unfortunate enough to deserve the anger of one's father, one should at least have enough respect for it to submit to the expression of it on his part. To try to frustrate it means to heap contempt on insult. I shall feel his anger in all its strength. You see, I tremble already. But I must tremble, and I will rather tremble than weep. Opens the letter. Now it is opened. I sink. But what do I see? She reads. My only dearest daughter. Ah, you old deceiver! Is that the language of an angry father? Go, I shall read no more. Ah, miss, you will pardon an old servant. Yes, Truly, I believe it is the first time in my life that I have intentionally deceived anyone. He who deceives once, miss, and deceives for so good a purpose, is surely no old deceiver on that account. That touches me deeply, miss. I know well that the good intention does not always excuse one. But what else could I do? To return this letter unread to such a good father... That certainly I cannot do. Sooner will I walk away as far as my old legs will carry me, and never again come into his presence. What? You too will leave him? Shall I not be obliged to do so if you do not read the letter? Read it, pray. Do not grudge a good result to the first deceit with which I have to reproach myself. You will forget it the sooner, and I shall the sooner be able to forgive myself. I am a common, simple man, who must not question the reasons why you cannot and will not read the letter. Whether they are true, I know not, but at any rate they do not appear to me to be natural. I should think thus, miss. A father, I should think, is after all a father, and a child may err for once, and remain a good child in spite of it. If the father pardons the error... The child may behave again in such a manner that the father may not even think of it any more. For who likes to remember what he would rather had never happened? It seems, miss, as if you thought only of your error, and believed you atoned sufficiently in exaggerating it in your imagination, and tormenting yourself with these exaggerated ideas. But I should think... You ought to consider how you could make up for what has happened. And how will you make up for it if you deprive yourself of every opportunity of doing so? Can it be hard for you to take the second step when such a good father has already taken the first? What daggers pierce my heart in your simple words! That he has to take the first step is just what I cannot bear. And besides, is it only the first step which he takes? He must do all. I cannot take a single one to meet him. As far as I have gone from him, so far must he descend to me. If he pardons me, he must pardon the whole crime, and in addition must bear the consequences of it continually before his eyes. Can one demand that from a father? I do not know, miss, whether I understand this quite right. But it seems to me you mean to say that he would have to forgive you too much— and as this could not but be very difficult to him, you make a scruple of accepting his forgiveness. If you mean that, tell me, pray, is not forgiving a great happiness to a kind heart? 
I have not been so fortunate in my life as to have felt this happiness often. But I still remember with pleasure the few instances when I have felt it. I felt something so sweet, something so tranquilizing, something so divine, that I could not help thinking of the great insurpassable blessedness of God, whose preservation of miserable mankind is a perpetual forgiveness. I wished that I could be forgiving continually, and was ashamed that I had only such trifles to pardon. To forgive real painful insults, deadly offenses, I said to myself, must be a bliss in which the whole soul melts. And now, miss, will you grudge your father such bliss? Ah, go on, Waitwell, go on. I know well there are people who accept nothing less willingly than forgiveness, and that because they have never learned to grant it. They are proud, unbending people, who will on no account confess that they have done wrong. But you do not belong to this kind, miss. You have the most loving and tender of hearts that the best of your sex can have. You confess your fault, too. Where, then, is the difficulty? But pardon me, miss, I am an old chatterer, and ought to have seen at once that your refusal is only a praiseworthy solicitude, only a virtuous timidity. People who can accept a great benefit immediately, without any hesitation, are seldom worthy of it. Those who deserve it most have always the greatest mistrust of themselves. Yet mistrust must not be pushed beyond limits. Dear old father, I believe you have persuaded me. If I have been so fortunate as that, it must have been a good spirit that has helped me to plead. But no, miss, my words have done no more than given you the time to reflect and to recover from the bewilderment of joy. You will read the letter now, will you not? I'll read it at once. I will do so, Waitwell. What regrets, what pain shall I feel? Pain, miss, but pleasant pain. Be silent. Begins reading to herself. Waitwell, aside. Oh, if he could see her himself. Sarah, after reading a few moments. Ah, oh, Waitwell, what a father! He calls my flight an absence. How much more culpable it becomes through this gentle word. Continues reading and interrupts herself again. Listen, he flatters himself I shall love him still. He flatters himself. He begs me. He begs me. A father begs his daughter, his culpable daughter. And what does he beg then? He begs me to forget his over-hasty severity and not to punish him any longer with my absence. Over-hasty severity. To punish. More still. Now he thanks me even, and thanks me that I have given him an opportunity of learning the whole extent of paternal love. Unhappy opportunity. Would that he also said it had shown him at the same time the extent of filial disobedience. No, he does not say it. He does not mention my crime with one single word. Continues reading. He will come himself and fetch his children. His children, wait well. That surpasses everything. Have I read it rightly? Reads again to herself. I am overcome. He says that he without whom he could not possess a daughter deserves but too well to be his son. Oh, that he had never had this unfortunate daughter. Go, wait well. Leave me alone. He wants an answer, and I will write it at once. Come again in an hour. I thank you, meanwhile, for your trouble. You are an honest man. Few servants are the friends of their masters. Do not make me blush, miss. If all masters were like Sir William, servants would be monsters if they would not give their lives for them. Exit. Scene 4. Sarah sits down to write. If they had told me a year ago that I should have to answer such a letter, and under such circumstances, yes, I have the pen in my hand. But do I know yet what I shall write? what I think, what I feel. And what then does one think when a thousand thoughts cross each other in one moment? And what does one feel when the heart is in a stupor from a thousand feelings? But I must write. I do not guide the pen for the first time. After assisting me in so many a little act of politeness and friendship, 
Should its help fail me at the most important office? She pauses and then writes a few lines. It shall commence so? A very cold beginning. And shall I then begin with his love? I must begin with my crime. She scratches it out and writes again. I must be on my guard not to express myself too leniently. Shame may be in its place anywhere else, but not in the confession of our faults. I need not fear falling into exaggeration, even though I employ the most dreadful terms. Ah! Am I to be interrupted now? Scene 5 Dearest Sarah, I have the honour of introducing Lady Soames to you. She is one of the members of my family to whom I feel myself most indebted. I must beg your pardon, madam, for taking the liberty of convincing myself with my own eyes of the happiness of a cousin for whom I should wish the most perfect of women, if the first moment had not at once convinced me that he has found her already in you. Your ladyship does me too much honour. Such a compliment would have made me blush at any time, but now I would almost take it as concealed reproach if I did not think that Lady Solmes is too much generous to let her superiority in virtue and wisdom be felt by an unhappy girl. I should be inconsolable if you attributed to me any but the most friendly feelings towards you. Aside, she is good-looking. Would it be possible, madam, to remain indifferent to such beauty, such modesty? People say, it is true, that one charming woman rarely does another one justice, but this is to be taken only of those who are over vain of their superiority, and on the other hand of those who are not conscious of possessing any superiority. How far are you both removed from this? To Marwood, who stands in deep thought. Is it not true, madam, that my love has been anything but partial? Is it not true that though I have said much to you in praise of my Sarah, I have not said nearly so much as you yourself see? But why so thoughtful? Aside to her. You forget whom you represent. May I say it? The admiration of your dear young lady led me to the contemplation of her fate. It touched me that she should not enjoy the fruits of her love in her native land. I recollected that she had to leave a father, and a very affectionate father, as I have been told, in order to become yours, and I could not but wish for her reconciliation with him. Ah, madam, how much am I indebted to you for this wish? It encourages me to tell you the whole of my happiness. You cannot yet know, Mellifont, that this wish was granted before Lady Solmes had the kindness to wish it. How do you mean, Sarah? Marwood, aside. How am I to interpret that? I have just received a letter from my father. Waitwell brought it to me. Ah, oh, Mellifont, such a letter! Quick, relieve me from my uncertainty. What have I to fear? What have I to hope? Is he still the father from whom we fled? And if he is, will Sarah be the daughter who loves me so tenderly as to fly again? Alas, had I but done as you wished, dear Sarah, we should now be united by a bond which no caprice could dissolve. I feel now all the misfortune which the discovery of our bird may bring upon me. He will come and tear you out of my arms. How I hate the contemptible being who has betrayed us to him! With an angry glance at Marwood. Dearest Mellifont, how flattering to me is this uneasiness! And how happy are we both in that it is unnecessary! Read his letter. To Marwood, whilst Mellifont reads the letter. He will be astonished at the love of my father. Of my father? Ah, he is his now, too. Is it possible? Yes, madam. You have good cause to be surprised at this change. He forgives us everything. We shall now love each other before his eyes. He allows it. He commands it. How has this kindness gone to my very soul? Well, Mellifont? Who returns the letter to her? You are silent. Oh, no. This tear which steals from your eye says far more than your lips could say. Marwood, aside. How have I injured my own cause, imprudent woman that I was? Oh, let me kiss this tear from your cheek. Ah, Sarah, why was it our fate to grieve such a godlike man? Yes, a godlike man, for what is more godlike than to forgive? Could we only have imagined such a happy issue possible, we should not now owe it to such violent means, we should owe it to our entreaties alone. What happiness is in store for me? 
But how painful also will be the conviction that I am so unworthy of this happiness. Marwood, aside. And I must be present to hear this. How perfectly you justify my love by such thoughts. Marwood, aside. What restraint must I put on myself? You too, madam, must read my father's letter. You seem to take too great an interest in our fate to be indifferent to its contents. Indifferent? Takes the letter. But, madam, you still seem very thoughtful, very sad. Thoughtful, but uh, not sad. Melifont, aside. Heavens, if she should betray herself. And why, then, thoughtful? I tremble for you both. Could not this unforeseen kindness of your father be a dissimulation, an artifice? Assuredly not, madam, assuredly not. Only read and you will admit it yourself. Dissimulation is always cold. It is not capable of such tender words. Do not grow suspicious, Melifont, I beg. I pledge myself that my father cannot condescend to an artifice. He says nothing which he does not think. Falseness is a vice unknown to him. Oh, of that I am thoroughly convinced, dearest Sarah. You must pardon Lady Soames for this suspicion, since she does not know the man whom it concerns. Sarah, whilst Marwood returns the letter to her. What do I see, my lady? You are pale, you tremble. What is the matter with you? Melifont, aside. What anxiety I suffer? Why did I bring her here? It is nothing but a slight dizziness which will pass over. The night air on my journey must have disagreed with me. You frighten me. Would you not like to go into the air? You will recover sooner than in a close room. If you think so, give me your arm. I will accompany your ladyship. I beg you will not trouble to do so. My faintness will pass over immediately. I hope, then, to see you again soon. If you permit me. Melifont conducts her out. Poor thing. She does not seem exactly the most friendly of people, but yet she does not appear to be either proud or ill-tempered. I am alone again. Can I employ the few moments while I remain so, better than by finishing my answer? Is about to sit down to write. Scene 6 That was indeed a very short visit. Yes, Betty. It was Lady Solmes, a relation of my Melifont. She was suddenly taken faint. Where is she now? Melifont has accompanied her to the door. She is gone again, then. I suppose so, but the more I look at you, you must forgive my freedom, miss, the more you seem to me to be altered. There is something calm, something contented in your looks. Either Lady Solmes must have been a very pleasant visitor, or the old man a very pleasant messenger. The latter, Betty, the latter. He came from my father. What a tender letter I have for you to read. Your kind heart has often wept with me. Now it shall rejoice with me, too. I shall be happy again, and be able to reward you for your good services. What services could I render you in nine short weeks? You could not have done more for me in all the rest of my life than in these nine weeks. They are over. But come now with me, Betty. As Melifont is probably alone again, I must speak to him. It just occurs to me that it would be well if he wrote at the same time to my father— to whom an expression of gratitude from him could hardly come unexpectedly. Come. Exeunt. Scene 7. The Drawing Room. What balm you have poured on my wounded heart with your words, wait well. I live again, and the prospect of her return seems to carry me as far back to my youth as her flight had brought me nearer to my grave. She loves me still. What more do I wish? Go back to her soon, Waitwell. I am impatient for the moment when I shall fold her again in these arms, which I had stretched out so longingly to death. How welcome would it have been to me in the moments of my grief, and how terrible will it be to me in my new happiness! An old man, no doubt, is to be blamed for drawing the bond so tight again which still unite him to the world. The final separation becomes the more painful. But God, who shows himself so merciful to me now, will also help me to go through this. Would he, I ask, grant me a mercy in order to let it become ray ruin in the end? Would he give me back a daughter that I should have to murmur when he calls me from life? No, no, he gives her back to me, 
that in my last hour I may be anxious about myself alone. Thanks to thee, Eternal Father, how feeble is the gratitude of mortal lips. But soon, soon I shall be able to thank him, more worthily in an eternity devoted to him alone. How it delights me, sir, to know you happy again before my death. Believe me, I have suffered almost as much in your grief as you yourself. Almost as much, for the grief of a father in such a case must be inexpressible. Do not regard yourself as my servant any longer, my good Waitwell. You have long deserved to enjoy a more seemly old age. I will give it to you, and you shall not be worse off than I am while I am still in this world. I will abolish all difference between us in yonder world. You well know it will be done. For this once be the old servant still on whom I never relied in vain. Go, and be sure to bring me her answer as soon as it is ready. I go, sir. But such an errand is not a service. It is a reward which you grant me for my services. Yes, truly it is so. Exeunt on different sides of the stage. End of Act Three. Act Four of Miss Sarah Sampson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer. Please visit LibriVox.org. Miss Sarah Sampson, A Tragedy in Five Acts, by G. E. Lessing. Act Four. Scene One. Melifont's Room. Yes, dearest Sarah, yes, that I will do, that I must do. How happy you make me! It is I who must take the whole crime upon myself. I alone am guilty. I alone must ask for forgiveness. No, Melifont, do not take from me the greater share which I have in our error. It is dear to me, however wrong it is, for it must have convinced you that I love my Melifont above everything in this world. But is it then really true that I may henceforth combine this love with the love of my father, or am I in a pleasant dream? How I fear it will pass, and I shall awaken in my old misery. But no, I am not merely dreaming. I am really happier than I ever dared hope to become, happier than this short life may perhaps allow. But perhaps this beam of happiness appears in the distance, and delusively seems to approach only in order to melt away again into thick darkness, and to leave me suddenly in a night whose whole terror has only become perceptible to me through the short illumination. What forebodings torment me! Are they really forebodings, Melifont, or are they common feelings, which are inseparable from the expectation of an undeserved happiness and the fear of losing it? How fast my heart beats, and how wildly it beats! How loud now! How quick! And now how weak, how anxious, how quivering! Now it hurries again, as if these were its last throbbings, which it would fain beat out rapidly. Poor heart! The tumult of your blood, which a sudden surprise cannot fail to cause, will abate, Sarah, and your heart will continue its work more calmly. None of its throbs point to aught that is in the future. And we are to blame. Forgive me, dearest Sarah, if we make the mechanic pressure of our blood into a profit of evil. But I will not leave anything undone which you yourself think good to appease this little storm within your breast. I will write at once, and I hope that Sir William will be satisfied with the assurances of my repentance, with the expressions of my stricken heart, and my vows of affectionate obedience. Sir William, ah, Melifont. You must begin now to accustom yourself to a far more tender name, my father, your father, Melifont. Very well, Sarah. How kind, how dear father! I was very young when I last used this sweet name. Very young when I had to unlearn the equally sweet name of mother. You had to unlearn it, and I, I was never so happy as to be able to pronounce it at all. My life was her death. Oh God, 
I was a guiltless matricide. And how much was wanting! How little, almost nothing, was wanting to my becoming a parricide, too! Not a guiltless, but a voluntary parricide. And who knows whether I am not so already! The years, the days, the moments by which he is nearer to his end than he would have been without the grief I have caused him, of those I have robbed him. However old and weary he may be when fate shall permit him to depart, my conscience will yet be unable to escape the reproach that but for me he might have lived yet longer. A sad reproach, with which I doubtless should not need to charge myself if a loving mother had guided me in my youth. Through her teaching and her example, my heart would. You look tenderly on me, Mellifont. You are right. A mother would perhaps have been a tyrant for very love, and I should not now belong to Mellifont. Why do I wish, then, for that, which a wiser fate denied me out of kindness? Its dispensations are always best. Let us only make proper use of that which it gives us. A father who never yet let me sigh for a mother— a father who will also teach you to forget the parents you lost so soon. What a flattering thought! I fall in love with it, and forget almost, that in my innermost heart there is still something which refuses to put faith in it. What is this rebellious something? This something, dearest Sarah, as you have already said yourself, is a natural timid incapability to realize a great happiness. Ah! Your heart hesitated less to believe itself unhappy than now. To its own torment, it hesitates to believe in its own happiness. But as to one who has become dizzy with quick movement, the external objects still appear to move round when again he is sitting still, so the heart, which has been violently agitated, cannot suddenly become calm again. There remains often, for a long time, a quivering palpitation which we must suffer to exhaust itself. I believe it, Mellifont. I believe it, because you say it, because I wish it. But do not let us detain each other any longer. I will go and finish my letter. And you will let me read yours, will you not, after I have shown you mine? Each word shall be submitted to your judgment, except what I must say in your defence, for I know you do not think yourself so innocent as you are. Accompany Sarah to the back of the stage. Scene 2 Mellifont, after walking up and down several times in thought. What a riddle I am to myself! What shall I think myself? A fool or a knave? Heart, what a villain thou art! I love thee, angel, however much of a devil I may be. I love her! Yes, certainly, certainly I love her. I feel I would sacrifice a thousand lives for her, for her who sacrificed her virtue for me. I would do so... This very moment without hesitation would I do so, and yet, yet, I am afraid to say it to myself, and yet, how shall I explain it? And yet, I fear the moment which will make her mind for ever before the world. It cannot be avoided now, for her father is reconciled, nor shall I be able to put it off for long. The delay has already drawn down painful reproaches enough upon me, but painful as they were, they were still more supportable to me than the melancholy thought of being fettered for life. But am I not so already? Certainly, and with pleasure. Certainly, I am already her prisoner. What is it I want, then? At present, I am a prisoner who is allowed to go about on parole. That is flattering. Why cannot the matter rest there? Why must I be put in chains and thus lack even the pitiable shadow of freedom? In chains? Quite so. Sarah Sampson, my beloved, what bliss lies in these words? Sarah Sampson, my wife. The half of the bliss is gone, and the other half will go. Monster that I am, and with such thoughts shall I write to her father? Yet these are not my real thoughts, they are fancies. Cursed fancies, which have become natural to me through my dissolute life. I will free myself from them, or live no more. Scene 3 You disturb me, Norton. I beg your pardon, sir. Withdrawing again. No, no, stay. It is just as well that you should disturb me. What do you want? I have heard some very good news from Betty, and have come to wish you happiness. On the reconciliation with her father, I suppose you mean... 
I thank you. So heaven still means to make you happy. If it means to do so. You see, Norton, I am just towards myself. It certainly does not mean it for my sake. No, no. If you feel that, then it will be for your sake also. For my Sarah's sake alone, if its vengeance, already armed, could spare the whole of a sinful city for the sake of a few just men, surely it can also bear with a sinner when a soul in which it finds delight is the sharer of his fate. You speak with earnestness and feeling, but does not joy express itself differently from this? Joy, Norton? Looking sharply at him. For me it is gone now for ever. May I speak candidly? You may. The reproach which I had to hear this morning of having made myself a participator in your crimes because I had been silent about them may excuse me if I am less silent henceforth. Only do not forget who you are. I will not forget that I am a servant, and a servant, alas, who might be something better if he had lived for it. I am your servant, it is true, but not so far as to wish to be damned along with you. With me? And why do you say that now? Because I am not a little astonished to find you different from what I expected. Will you not inform me what you expected? To find you all delight. It is only the common herd who are beside themselves immediately when luck smiles on them for once. Perhaps because the common herd still have the feelings which among greater people are corrupted and weakened by a thousand unnatural notions. But there is something besides moderation to be read in your face. Coldness. Irresolution. Disinclination. And if so, have you forgotten who is here beside Sarah? The presence of Marwood? Could make you anxious, I dare say, but not despondent. Something else troubles you, and I shall be glad to be mistaken in thinking you would rather that the father were not yet reconciled. The prospect of a position which so little suits your way of thinking. Norton, Norton! Either you must have been, or still must be, a dreadful villain, that you can thus guess my thoughts. Since you have hit the nail upon the head, I will not deny it. It is true, so certain as it is that I shall love my Sarah for ever so little does it please me, that I must, must love her for ever. But do not fear, I shall conquer this foolish fancy. Or do you think that it is no fancy? Who bids me look at marriage as compulsion? I certainly do not wish to be freer than she will permit me to be. These reflections are all very well. But Marwood will come to the aid of your old prejudices, and I fear, I fear... That which will never happen. You shall see her go back this very evening to London. And as I have confessed my most secret folly, we will call it for the present, I must not conceal it from you either that I have put Marwood into such a fright that she will obey the slightest hint from me. That sounds incredible to me. Look, I snatched this murderous steel from her hand. Showing the dagger which she had taken from Marwood. When in a fearful rage she was on the point of stabbing me to the heart with it. Will you believe now that I offered her a stout resistance? At first she well nigh succeeded in throwing her noose around my neck again. The traitoress! She has Arabella with her. Arabella? I have not yet been able to fathom by what cunning she got that child back into her hands again. Enough. The result did not fall out as she no doubt had expected. Allow me to rejoice at your firmness and to consider your reformation half assured. Yet, as you wish me to know all, what business had she here under the name of Lady Solmes? She wanted of all things to see her rival. I granted her wish, partly from kindness, partly from rashness, partly from the desire to humiliate her by the sight of the best of her sex. You shake your head, Norton. I should not have risked that. Risked? I did not risk anything more, after all, than what I should have had to risk if I had refused her. She would have tried to obtain admittance as Marwood, and the worst that can be expected from her incognito visit is not worse than that. Thank heaven that it went off so quietly. It is not quite over yet, Norton. A slight indisposition came over her, and compelled her to go away without taking leave. She wants to come again. Let her do so. The wasp which has lost its sting, pointing to the dagger, can do nothing worse than buzz. 
her buzzing too shall cost her dear, if she grows too troublesome with it. Do I not hear somebody coming? Leave me, if it should be she. It is she. Go. Exit Norton. Scene 4. No doubt you are little pleased to see me again. I am very pleased, Marwood, to see that your indisposition has had no further consequences. You are better, I hope? So-so. You have not done well, then, to trouble to come here again. I thank you, Melifont, if you say this out of kindness to me, and I do not take it amiss if you have another meaning in it. I am pleased to see you so calm. The storm is over. Forget it, I beg you once more. Only remember your promise, Marwood, and I will forget everything with pleasure. But if I knew that you would not consider it an offence, I should like to ask... Ask on, Melifont. You cannot offend me any more. What were you going to ask? How you liked my Sarah. The question is natural. My answer will not seem so natural, but it is none the less true for that. I liked her very much. Such impartiality delights me, but would it be possible for him who knew how to appreciate the charms of a Marwood to make a bad choice? You ought to have spared me this flattery, Melifont, if it is flattery. It is not in accordance with our intention to forget each other. You surely do not wish me to facilitate this intention by rudeness? Do not let our separation be of an ordinary nature. Let us break with each other as people of reason who yield to necessity, without bitterness, without anger, and with the preservation of a certain degree of respect, as behoves our former intimacy. Former intimacy. I do not wish to be reminded of it. No more of it. What must be, must, and it matters little how. But one more word about Arabella. You will not let me have her? No, Marwood. It is cruel, since you can no longer be her father, to take her mother also from her. I can still be her father, and will be so. Prove it, then, now. How? Permit Arabella to have the riches which I have in keeping for you, as her father's inheritance. As to her mother's inheritance, I wish I could leave her a better one than the shame of having been born by me. Do not speak so. I shall provide for Arabella without embarrassing her mother's property. If she wishes to forget me, she must begin by forgetting that she possesses anything from me. I have obligations towards her, and I shall never forget that, really, though against her will she has promoted my happiness. Yes, Marwood, in all seriousness, I thank you for betraying our retreat to a father whose ignorance of it alone prevented him from receiving us again. Do not torture me with gratitude which I never wished to deserve. Sir William is too good an old fool. He must think differently from what I should have thought in his place. I should have forgiven my daughter, but as to her seducer, I should have... Marwood! True, you yourself are the seducer. I am silent. Shall I be presently allowed to pay my farewell visit to Miss Sampson? Sarah could not be offended, even if you left without seeing her again. Malifont, I do not like playing my part by halves, and I have no wish to be taken, even under an assumed name, for a woman without breeding. If you care for your own peace of mind, you ought to avoid seeing a person again who must awaken certain thoughts in you which... Marwood smiling disdainfully. You have a better opinion of yourself than of me. But even if you believed that I should be inconsolable on your account, you ought at least to believe it in silence. Miss Sampson would awaken certain thoughts in me. Certain thoughts? Oh, yes, but none more certain than this, that the best girl can often love the most worthless man. Charming, Marwood, perfectly charming. Now you are as I have long wished to see you, although I could almost have wished, as I told you before, that we could have retained some respect for each other. But this may perhaps come still, when once your fermenting heart has cooled down. Excuse me for a moment. I will fetch Miss Sampson to see you. Scene 5. Marwood, looking round. Am I alone? Can I take breath again unobserved and let the muscles of my face relax into the natural position? I must just for a moment be the true Marwood again in all my features, to be able again to bear the restraint of dissimulation. 
Oh, how I hate thee, base dissimulation! Not because I love sincerity, but because thou art the most pitiable refuge of powerless revenge. I certainly would not condescend to thee if a tyrant would lend me his power, or heaven its thunderbolt. Yet if thou only servest my end. The beginning is promising, and Melifont seems disposed to grow more confident. If my device succeeds, and I can speak alone with his Sarah, then yes. Then it is still very uncertain whether it will be of any use to me. The truths about Melifont will perhaps be no novelty to her, the calumnies she will perhaps not believe, and the threats perhaps despise. But yet she shall hear truths, calumnies, and threats. It would be bad if they did not leave any sting at all in her mind. Silence. They are coming. I am no longer Marwood. I am a worthless outcast who tries by little artful tricks to turn aside her shame. A bruised worm which turns and fain would wound at least the heel of him who trod upon it. Scene 6 I am happy, madam, that my uneasiness on your account has been unnecessary. I thank you. The attack was so insignificant that it need not have made you uneasy. Lady Soames wishes to take leave of you, dearest Sarah. So soon, madam. I cannot go soon enough for those who desire my presence in London. You surely are not going to leave today. Tomorrow morning, first thing. Tomorrow morning, first thing? I thought today. Our acquaintance, madam, commences hurriedly. I hope to be honoured with a more intimate intercourse with you at some future time. I solicit your friendship, Miss Sampson. I pledge myself, dearest Sarah, that this desire of Lady Soames is sincere, although I must tell you beforehand that you will certainly not see each other again for a long time. Lady Soames will very rarely be able to live where we are. Marwood, aside. How subtle. That is to deprive me of a very pleasant anticipation, Melifont. I shall be the greatest loser. But in reality, madam, do you not start before tomorrow morning? It may be sooner. Aside. No one comes. We do not wish to remain much longer here either. It will be well, will it not, Sarah, to follow our answer without delay? So William cannot be displeased with our haste. Scene 7 What is it, Betty? Somebody wishes to speak with you immediately. Marwood. Aside. Ha! Now all depends on whether... Me? Immediately? I will come at once. Madam... Is it agreeable to you to shorten your visit? Why so, Melifont? Lady Solmes will be so kind as to wait for your return. Pardon me. I know my cousin Melifont and prefer to depart with him. The stranger, sir. He wishes only to say a word to you. He says that he has not a moment to lose. Go, please. I will be with him directly. I expect it will be some news at last about the agreement which I mentioned to you. Exit Betty. Marwood. Aside. A good conjecture. But still, madam. If you order it, then I must bid you. Oh, no, Melifont. I am sure you will not grudge me the pleasure of entertaining Lady Solmes during your absence. You wish it, Sarah? Do not stay now, dearest Melifont, but come back again soon. And come with a more joyful face, I will wish. You doubtless expect an unpleasant answer. Don't let this disturb you. I am more desirous to see whether, after all, you can gracefully prefer me to an inheritance than I am to know that you are in the possession of one. I obey. I shall be sure to come back in a moment, madam. Marwood. Aside. Lucky so far. Exit Melifont. Scene 8. My good Melifont sometimes gives his polite phrases quite a wrong accent. Do not you think so too, madam? I am no doubt too much accustomed to his way already to notice anything of that sort. Will you not take a seat, madam? If you desire it. Aside whilst they are seating themselves. I must not let this moment slip by unused. Tell me, shall I not be the most enviable of women with my Melifont? If Melifont knows how to appreciate his happiness, Miss Sampson will make him the most enviable of men. But... A but, and then a pause, madam. I am frank, Miss Sampson. And for this reason infinitely more to be esteemed. 
Frank, not seldom imprudently so. My but is a proof of it. A very imprudent but. I do not think that my Lady Psalms can wish through this evasion to make me more uneasy. It must be a cruel mercy that only rouses suspicions of an evil which it might disclose. Not at all, Miss Sampson. You attach far too much importance to my but. Melifont is a relation of mine. Then all the more important is the slightest charge which you have to make against him. But even were Melifont my brother, I must tell you that I should unhesitatingly side with one of my own sex against him, if I perceived that he did not act quite honestly towards her. We women ought properly to consider every insult shown to one of us as an insult to the whole sex, and to make it a common affair in which even the sister and mother of the guilty one ought not to hesitate to share. This remark has already been my guide now and then in doubtful cases. And promises me. I tremble. No, Miss Sampson, if you mean to tremble, let us speak of something else. Cruel woman! I am sorry to be misunderstood. I, at least, if I place myself in imagination in Miss Sampson's position, would regard as a favour any more exact information which one might give me about the man with whose fate I was about to unite my own forever. What do you wish, madam? Do I not know my Melifont already? Believe me, I know him as I do my own soul. I know that he loves me. And others? Has loved others. That I know also. Was he to love me before he knew anything about me? Can I ask to be the only one who has had charm enough to attract him? Must I not confess it to myself that I have striven to please him? Is he not so lovable that he must have awakened this endeavour in many a breast? And isn't it but natural if several have been successful in their endeavour? You defend him with just the same ardour and almost the same words with which I have often defended him already. It is no crime to have loved, much less still is it a crime to have been loved. But fickleness is a crime. Not always. For often, I believe, it is rendered excusable by the objects of one's love, which seldom deserve to be loved for ever. Miss Sampson's doctrine of morals does not seem to be of the strictest. It is true. The one by which I judge those who themselves confess that they have taken to bad ways is not of the strictest. Nor should it be so. For here it is not a question of fixing the limits which virtue marks out for love— but merely of excusing the human weakness that has not remained within those limits, and of judging the consequences arising therefrom by the rules of wisdom. If, for example, a Melifont loves a Marwood, and eventually abandons her, this abandonment is very praiseworthy in comparison with the love itself. It would be a misfortune if he had to love a vicious person for ever because he had once loved her. But do you know this Marwood, whom you so confidently call a vicious person? I know her from Melifont's description. Melifont's? Has it never occurred to you, then, that Melifont must be a very invalid witness in his own affairs? I see now, madam, that you wish to put me to the test. Melifont will smile when you repeat to him how earnestly I have defended him. I beg your pardon, Miss Sampson. Melifont must not hear anything about this conversation. You are of too noble a mind to wish out of gratitude for a well-meant warning to estrange from him a relation who speaks against him only because she looks upon his unworthy behaviour towards more than one of the most amiable of her sex, as if she herself had suffered from it. I do not wish to estrange any one, and would that others wished it as little as I do. Shall I tell you the story of Marwood in a few words? I do not know. But still, yes, madam, but under the condition that you stop as soon as Melifont returns, he might think that I had inquired about it myself, and I should not like him to think me capable of a curiosity so prejudicial to him. I should have asked the same caution of Miss Sampson if she had not anticipated me. He must not even be able to suspect that Marwood has been our topic, and you will be so cautious as to act in accordance with this. Here now. Marwood is of good family. She was a young widow when Melifont made her acquaintance at the house of one of her friends. They say that she lacked neither beauty nor the grace without which beauty would be nothing. 
Her good name was spotless. One single thing was wanting. Money. Everything that she had possessed, and she is said to have had considerable wealth, she had sacrificed for the deliverance of a husband from whom she thought it right to withhold nothing after she had willed to give him heart and hand. Truly a noble trait of character, which I wish could sparkle in a better setting. In spite of her want of fortune, she was sought by persons who wished nothing more than to make her happy. Melifont appeared among her rich and distinguished admirers. His offer was serious, and the abundance in which he promised to place Marwood was the least on which he relied. He knew, in their earliest intimacy, that he had not to deal with an egoist, but with a woman of refined feelings who would have preferred to live in a hut with one she loved than in a palace with one for whom she did not care. Another trait which I grudge, Miss Marwood. Do not flatter her any more, pray, madam, or I might be led to pity her at last. Melifond was just about to unite himself with her with due solemnity when he received the news of the death of a cousin who left him his entire fortune on the condition that he should marry a distant relation. As Marwood had refused richer unions for his sake, he would not now yield to her in generosity. He intended to tell her nothing of this inheritance until he had forfeited it through her. That was generously planned, was it not? Oh, madam, who knows better than I that Melifont possesses the most generous of hearts? But what did Marwood do? She heard late one evening, through some friends of Melifont's resolution. Melifont came in the morning to see her, and Marwood was gone. Where to? Why? He found nothing but a letter from her, in which she told him that he must not expect ever to see her again. She did not deny, though, that she loved him, but for this very reason she could not bring herself to be the cause of an act of which he must necessarily repent some day. She released him from his promise, and begged him by the consummation of the union, demanded by the will, to enter without further delay into the possession of a fortune which an honourable man could employ for a better purpose than the thoughtless flattery of a woman. But, madam, why do you attribute such noble sentiments to Marwood? Lady Solmes may be capable of such, I dare say, but not Marwood. Certainly not Marwood. It is not surprising that you are prejudiced against her. Melifont was almost distracted at Marwood's resolution. He sent people in all directions to search for her, and at last found her. No doubt because she wished to be found. No bitter jests. They do not become a woman of such gentle disposition. I say he found her and found her inexorable. She would not accept his hand on any account, and the promise to return to London was all that he could get from her. They agreed to postpone their marriage until his relative, tired of the long delay, should be compelled to propose an arrangement. In the meantime, Marwood could not well renounce the daily visits from Melifont, which for a long time were nothing but the respectful visits of a suitor who has been ordered back within the bounds of friendship. But how impossible it is for a passionate temper not to transgress these bounds. Melifont possesses everything which can make a man dangerous to us. Nobody can be more convinced of this than you yourself, Miss Sampson. Alas! You sigh. Marwood, too, has sighed more than once over her weakness, and sighs yet. Enough, madam, enough! These words, I should think, are worse than the bitter jest which you were pleased to forbid me. Its intention was not to offend you, but only to show you the unhappy Marwood in a light in which you could most correctly judge her. To be brief, love gave Melifont the rights of a husband, and Melifont did not any longer consider it necessary to have them made valid by the law. How happy would Marwood be if she, Melifont, and heaven alone knew of her shame— how happy if a pitiable daughter did not reveal to the whole world that which she would fain be able to hide from herself. What do you say? A daughter? Yes. Through the intervention of Sarah Sampson, an unhappy daughter loses all hope of ever being able to name her parents without abhorrence. Terrible words! And Melifont has concealed this from me? Am I to believe it, madam? You may assuredly believe that Melifont has perhaps concealed still more from you. Still more? 
What more could he have concealed from me? This, that he still loves Marwood. You will kill me! It is incredible that a love which has lasted more than ten years can die away so quickly. It may certainly suffer a short eclipse, but nothing but a short one, from which it breaks forth again with renewed brightness. I could name to you a Miss Ockleff, a Miss Dorcas, a Miss Moore, and several others, who, one after another, threatened to alienate from Marwood the man by whom they eventually saw themselves most cruelly deceived. There is a certain point beyond which he cannot go, and as soon as he gets face to face with it, he draws suddenly back. But suppose, Miss Sampson, you were the one fortunate woman in whose case all circumstances declared themselves against him. Suppose you succeeded in compelling him to conquer the disgust of a formal yoke which has now become innate to him. Do you then expect to make sure of his heart in this way? Miserable girl that I am! What must I hear? Nothing less than that. He would then hurry back all the more into the arms of her who had not been so jealous of his liberty. You would be called his wife, and she would be it. Do not torment me longer with such dreadful pictures. Advise me, rather, madam, I pray you advise me what to do. You must know him. You must know by what means it may still be possible to reconcile him with a bond, without which... Even the most sincere love remains an unholy passion. That one can catch a bird, I well know, but that one can render its cage more pleasant than the open field, I do not know. My advice, therefore, would be that one should rather not catch it, and should spare oneself the vexation of the profitless trouble. Content yourself, young lady, with the pleasure of having seen him very near your net— and as you can foresee that he would certainly tear it if you tempted him in altogether, spare your net, and do not tempt him in. I do not know whether I rightly understand your playful parable. If you are vexed with it, you have understood it. In one word, your own interest as well as that of another, wisdom as well as justice can and must induce Miss Sampson to renounce her claims to a man to whom Marwood has the first and strongest claim. You are still in such a position with regard to him that you can withdraw, I will not say with much honour, but still without public disgrace. A short disappearance with a lover is a stain, it is true, but still a stain which time effaces. In some years all will be forgotten, and for a rich heiress there are always men to be found who are not so scrupulous. If Marwood were in such a position, and she needed no husband for her fading charms, nor father for her helpless daughter, I am sure she would act more generously towards Miss Sampson than Miss Sampson acts towards her when raising these dishonourable difficulties. Sarah, rising angrily. This is too much. Is that the language of a relative of Maliphant's? How shamefully you are betrayed, Maliphant! Now I perceive, madam, why he was so unwilling to leave you alone with me. He knows already, I dare say, how much one has to fear from your tongue. A poisoned tongue. I speak boldly, for your unseemly talk has continued long enough. How has Marwood been able to enlist such a mediator? a mediator who summons all her ingenuity to force upon me a dazzling romance about her, and employs every art to rouse my suspicion against the loyalty of a man, who was a man but not a monster. Was it only for this that I was told that Marwood boasted of a daughter from him? Only for this that I was told of this and that forsaken girl, in order that you might be enabled to hint to me, in cruel fashion, that I should do well if I gave place to a hardened strumpet." Not so passionate, if you please, young lady. A hardened strumpet? You are surely using words whose full meaning you have not considered. Does she not appear such, even from Lady Solmes's description? Well, madam, you are her friend, perhaps her intimate friend. I do not say this as a reproach, for it may well be that it is hardly possible in this world to have virtuous friends only. Yet why should I be so humiliated for the sake of this friendship of yours? If I had had Marwood's experience, I should certainly not have committed the error which places me on such a humiliating level with her. But if I had committed it, I should certainly not have continued in it for ten years. 
it is one thing to fall into vice from ignorance, and another to grow intimate with it when you know it. Alas, madam, if you knew what regret, what remorse, what anxiety my error has cost me! My error, I say, for why shall I be so cruel to myself any longer and look upon it as a crime? Heaven itself ceases to consider it such. It withdraws my punishment and gives me back my father. But I am frightened, madam. How your features are suddenly transformed! The glow rage speaks from the fixed eye and the quivering movement of the mouth. Ah, if I have vexed you, madam, I beg for pardon. I am a foolish, sensitive creature. What you have said was doubtless not meant so badly. Forgive my rashness. How can I pacify you? How can I also gain a friend in you as Marwood has done? Let me, let me entreat you on my knees. Falling down upon her knees. For your friendship. And if I cannot have this, at least for the justice not to place me and Marwood in one and the same rank. Marwood proudly stepping back and leaving Sarah on her knees. This position of Sarah Sampson is too charming for Marwood to triumph in it unrecognized. In me, Miss Sampson, behold the Marwood with whom on your knees you beg Marwood herself not to compare you. Sarah, springing up and drawing back in terror. You, Marwood! Ha! Oh, now I recognize her! Now I recognize the murderous deliverer, to whose dagger a warning dream exposed me. It is she! Away, unhappy Sarah! Save me, Melifont, save your beloved! And thou, sweet voice of my beloved father, call! Where does it call? Whither shall I hasten to it? Here? There? Help, Melifont! Help, Betty! Now she approaches me with murderous hand! Help! Exit. What does the excitable girl mean? Would that she spake the truth and that I approached her with murderous hand. I ought to have spared the dagger until now, fool that I was. What delight to be able to stab a rival at one's feet in her voluntary humiliation. What now? I am detected. Melifont may be here this minute. Shall I fly from him? Shall I await him? I will wait, but not in idleness. Perhaps the cunning of my servant will detain him long enough. I see I am feared. Why do I not follow her, then? Why do I not try the last expedient which I can use against her? Threats are pitiable weapons, but despair despises no weapons, however pitiable they may be. A timid girl who flies stupid and terror-stricken from my mere name can easily take dreadful words for dreadful deeds. But Melifont, Melifont will give her fresh courage and teach her to scorn my threats. He will. Perhaps he will not. Few things would have been undertaken in this world if man had always looked to the end. And am I not prepared for the most fatal end? The dagger was for others. The drug is for me. The drug for me. Long carried by me near my heart, it here awaits its sad service, here where in better times I hid the written flatteries of my lovers, poison for us equally sure, if slower. Would it were not destined to rage in my veins only? Would that a faithless one— Why do I waste my time in wishing? Away! I must not recover my reason, nor she hers. He will dare nothing— who wishes to dare in cold blood. End of Act 4 Act 5 of Miss Sarah Sampson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miss Sarah Sampson, A Tragedy in Five Acts, by G. E. Lessing. Act Five. Scene One. Sarah's Room. Sarah reclining in an armchair, and Betty. Do you feel a little better, Miss? Better. I wish only that Melifont would return. You have sent for him, have you not? 
Norton and the landlord have gone for him. Norton is a good fellow, but he is rash. I do not want him by any means to be rude to his master on my account. According to his story, Mellifont is innocent of all this. She follows him. What can he do? She storms, she raves, she tries to murder him. Do you see, Betty, I have exposed him to this danger? Who else but me? And the wicked Marwood at last insisted on seeing me, or she would not return to London. Could he refuse her this trifling request? Have not I too often been curious to see Marwood? Mellifont knows well that we are curious creatures. And if I had not insisted myself that she should remain with me until his return, he would have taken her away with him. I should have seen her under a false name, without knowing that I had seen her. And I should perhaps have been pleased with this little deception at some future time. In short, it is all my fault. Well, well, I was frightened, nothing more. The swoon was nothing. You know, Betty, I am subject to such fits. But I had never seen you in so deep a swoon before. Do not tell me so, please. I must have caused you a good deal of trouble, my good girl. Marwood herself seemed moved by your danger. In spite of all I could do, she would not leave the room until you had opened your eyes a little and I could give you the medicine. After all, I must consider it fortunate that I swooned. For who knows what more I should have had to hear from her. She certainly can hardly have followed me into my room without a purpose. You cannot imagine how terrified I was. The dreadful dream I had last night recurred to me suddenly, and I fled, like an insane woman who does not know why and whither she flies. But Mellifont does not come. Ah! What a sigh, miss! What convulsions! God! What sensation was this? What was that? Nothing, Betty. A pain. Not one pain, a thousand burning pains in one. But do not be uneasy. It is over now. Scene two. Mellifont will be here in a moment. That is well, Norton. But where did you find him? A stranger had enticed him beyond the town gate, where he said a gentleman waited for him to speak with him about matters of the greatest importance. After taking him from place to place for a long time, the swindler slunk away from him. It will be bad for him if he lets himself be caught. Mellifont is furious. Did you tell him what has happened? All. But in such a way? I could not think about the way. Enough. He knows what anxiety his imprudence has again caused you. Not so, Norton. I have caused it myself. Why may Malifont never be in the wrong? Come in, sir. Love has already excused you. Scene three. Ah, oh, Sarah, if this love of yours were not... Then I should certainly be the unhappier of the two. If nothing more vexatious has happened to you in your absence than to me, I am happy. I have not deserved to be so kindly received. Let my weakness be my excuse that I do not receive you more tenderly. If only for your sake, I would that I was well again. Ah, Marwood, this treachery too. The scoundrel who led me with a mysterious air from one street to another can assuredly have been a messenger of her only. See, dearest Sarah, she employed this artifice to get me away from you. A clumsy artifice, certainly. But just from its very clumsiness, I was far from taking it for one. She shall have a reward for this treachery. Quick, Norton, go to her lodging. Do not lose sight of her, and detain her until I come. What for, Mellifont? I intercede for Marwood. Go. Exit Norton. Scene 4 Pray let the wearied enemy who has ventured the last fruitless assault retire in peace. Without Marwood I should be ignorant of much. Much? What is the much? What you would not have told me, Mellifont. You start. Well, I will forget it again, since you do not wish me to know it. I hope that you will not believe any ill of me which has no better foundation than the jealousy of an angry slanderer. More of this another time. But why do you not tell me first of all about the danger in which your precious life was placed? I, Mellifont, I should have been the one who had sharpened the sword— with which Marwood had stabbed you. The danger was not so great. Marwood was driven by blind passion, and I was cool, so her attack could not but fail. I only wish that she may not have been more successful with another attack. Upon Sarah's good opinion of her Mellifont, I must almost fear it. No, dearest Sarah, 
Do not conceal from me any longer what you have learned from her. Well, if I had still had the least doubt of your love, Melifont, Marwood in her anger would have removed it. She surely must feel that through me she has lost that which is of the greatest value to her, for an uncertain loss would have let her act more cautiously. I shall soon learn to set some store by her bloodthirsty jealousy, her impetuous insolence, her treacherous cunning. But, Sarah, you wish again to evade my question, and not to reveal to me. I will, and what I said was indeed a step towards it. That Melifont loves me, then, is undeniably certain. If only I had not discovered that his love lacked a certain confidence, which would be as flattering to me as his love itself. In short, dearest Melifont, why does a sudden anxiety make it so difficult for me to speak? Well, I suppose I shall have to tell it without seeking for the most prudent form in which to say it. Marwood mentioned a pledge of love, and the talkative Norton, forgive him, pray, told me a name, a name, Melifont, which must rouse in you another tenderness than that which you feel for me. Is it possible? Has the shameless woman confessed her own disgrace? Alas, Sarah, have pity on my confusion. Since you already know all, why do you wish to hear it again from my lips? She shall never come into your sight. The unhappy child, who has no other fault than that of having such a mother. You love her, then, in spite of all? Too much, Sarah, too much for me to deny it. Ah, Melifont! How I, too, love you for this very love's sake! You would have offended me deeply if you had denied the sympathy of your blood for any scruples on my account. You have hurt me already, in that you have threatened me never to let her come into my sight. No, Melifont, that you will never forsake Arabella must be one of the promises which you vow to me in presence of the Almighty. In the hands of her mother she is in danger of becoming unworthy of her father. Use your authority over both, and let me take the place of Marwood. Do not refuse me the happiness of bringing up for myself a friend who owes her life to you, a Melifont of my own sex. Happy days, when my father, when you, when Arabella will vie in your calls on my filial respect, my confiding love, my watchful friendship. Happy days! But alas, they are still far distant in the future— and perhaps even the future knows nothing of them. Perhaps they exist only in my own desire for happiness. Sensations, Melifont, sensations which I never before experienced turned my eyes to another prospect. A dark prospect, with awful shadows. What sensations are these? Puts her hand before her face. What sudden change from exultation to terror? Hasten, Betty, bring help. What ails you, generous Sarah? Divine soul, why does this jealous hand, moving it away, hide these sweet looks from me? Are they looks which unwillingly betray cruel pain? And yet this hand is jealous to hide these looks from me. Shall I not share your pain with you? Unhappy man, that I can only share it, that I may not feel it alone. Hasten, Betty. Whither shall I hasten? You see, and yet ask, for help. Stay, it passes over. I will not frighten you again, Melifont. What has happened to her, Betty? These are not merely the results of a swoon. Scene 5 You are back again already, Norton? That is well. You will be of more use here. Marwood is gone. And my curses follow her. She is gone? Whither? May misfortune and death, and were it possible, a whole hell lie in her path. May heaven thunder a consuming fire upon her. May the earth burst open under her, and swallow the greatest of female monsters. As soon as she returned to her lodgings, she threw herself into her carriage, together with Arabella and her maid, and hurried away at full gallop. This sealed note was left behind for you. Melifont, taking the note. It is addressed to me. Shall I read it, Sarah? When you are calmer, Melifont. Calmer? Can I be calmer before I have revenged myself on her, and before I know that you are out of danger, dearest Sarah? Let me not hear of revenge. Revenge is not ours. But you open the letter. Alas, Melifont, 
Why are we less prone to certain virtues with a healthy body which feels its strength than with a sick and wearied one? How hard are gentleness and moderation to you, and how unnatural to me appears the impatient heat of passion! Keep the contents for yourself alone. What spirit is it that seems to compel me to disobey you? I opened it against my will, and against my will I must read it. Sarah, whilst Melifont reads to himself. How cunningly man can disunite his nature, and make of his passions another being than himself, on whom he can lay the blame for that which in cold blood he disapproves. The water, Betty, I fear another shock, and shall need it. Do you see what effect the unlucky note has on him? Melifont, you lose your senses, Melifont. God, he is stunned. Here, Betty, hand him the water, he needs it more than I. Melifont pushing Betty back. Back, unhappy girl, your medicines are poison. What do you say? Recover yourself, you do not recognize her. I am Betty. Take it. Wish, rather, unhappy girl, that you were not she. Quick, fly, before, in default of the guilty one, you become the guilty victim of my rage. What words? Melifont, dearest Melifont. The last, dearest Melifont from these divine lips? and then no more for ever. At your feet, Sarah. Throwing himself down. But why at your feet? Springing up again. Disclose it? I disclose it to you? Yes, I will tell you that you will hate me, that you must hate me. You shall not hear the contents, no, not from me, but you will hear them, you will... Why do you all stand here, stock still, doing nothing? Run, Norton, bring all the doctors. Seek help, Betty. Let your help be as effective as your error. No, stop here. I will go myself. Whither, Melifont? Help for what? Of what error do you speak? Divine help, Sarah, or inhuman revenge. You are lost, dearest Sarah. I, too, am lost. Would the world were lost with us? Scene 6 he is gone. I am lost. What does he mean? Do you understand him, Norton? I am ill, very ill. But suppose the worst, that I must die. Am I therefore lost? And why does he blame you, poor Betty? You wring your hands. Do not grieve. You cannot have offended him. He will bethink himself. Had he only done as I wished and not read the note— he could have known that it must contain the last poisoned words from Marwood. What terrible suspicion! No, it cannot be. I do not believe it. Your father's old servant, miss. Let him come in, Norton. Scene 7 I suppose you are anxious for my answer, dear Waitwell. It is ready except a few lines. But why so alarmed? They must have told you that I am ill. And more still. Dangerously ill? I conclude so from Melifont's passionate anxiety more than from my own feelings. Suppose, Waitwell, you should have to go with an unfinished letter from your unhappy Sarah to her still more unhappy father. Let us hope for the best. Will you wait until tomorrow? Perhaps I shall find a few good moments to finish off the letter to your satisfaction. At present I cannot do so. This hand hangs as if dead by my benumbed side— if the whole body dies away as easily as these limbs. You are an old man, Waitwell, and cannot be far from the last scene. Believe me, if that which I feel is the approach of death, then the approach of death is not so bitter. Ah! Do not mind this sigh. Wholly without unpleasant sensation it cannot be. Man could not be void of feeling. He must not be impatient. But Betty— why are you so inconsolable? Permit me, miss. Permit me to leave you. Go. I well know it is not every one who can bear to be with the dying. Waitwell shall remain with me. And you, Norton, will do me a favor if you go and look for your master. I long for his presence. Betty, going. Alas, Norton, I took the medicine from Marwood's hands. Scene 8 Waitwell if you will do me the kindness to remain with me, you must not let me see such a melancholy face. You are mute. Speak, I pray, and if I may ask it, speak of my father. 
Repeat all the comforting words which you said to me a few hours ago. Repeat them to me, and tell me, too, that the eternal Heavenly Father cannot be less merciful. I can die with that assurance, can I not? Had this befallen me before your arrival, how would I have fared? I should have despaired, Waitwell. To leave this world burdened with the hatred of him who belies his nature when he is forced to hate. What a thought! Tell him that I died with the feelings of the deepest remorse, gratitude, and love. Tell him, alas, that I shall not tell him myself. How full my heart is of all the benefits I owe to him! My life was the smallest among them. Would that I could yield up at his feet the ebbing portion yet remaining. Do you really wish to see him, miss? At length you speak, to doubt my deepest, my last desire. Where shall I find the words which I have so long been vainly seeking? A sudden joy is as dangerous as a sudden terror. I fear only that the effect of his unexpected appearance might be too violent for so tender a heart. What do you mean? The unexpected appearance of whom? Of the wished-for one. Compose yourself. Scene 9 You stay too long, wait well. I must see her. Whose voice? Oh, my daughter. Oh, my father. Help me to rise, Waitwell. Help me to rise, that I may throw myself at his feet. She endeavors to rise and falls back again into the armchair. Is it he? Or is it an apparition sent from heaven, like the angel who came to strengthen the strong one? Bless me, whoever thou art, whether a messenger from the highest in my father's form or my father himself. God bless thee, my daughter. Keep quiet. She tries again to throw herself at his feet. Another time when you have regained your strength, I shall not be displeased to see you clasp my faltering knees. Now, my father, or never. Soon I shall be no more. I shall be only too happy if I still have a few moments to reveal my heart to you. But not moments. Whole days, another life, would be necessary to tell all that a guilty, chastened, and repentant daughter can say to an injured but generous and loving father. My offense and your forgiveness. Do not reproach yourself for your weakness, nor give me credit for that which is only my duty. When you remind me of my pardon, you remind me also of my hesitation in granting it. Why did I not forgive you at once? Why did I reduce you to the necessity of flying from me? And this very day, when I had already forgiven you, what was it that forced me to wait first for an answer from you? I could already have enjoyed a whole day with you if I had hastened at once to your arms. Some latent spleen must still have lain in the innermost recesses of my disappointed heart that I wished first to be assured of the continuance of your love before I gave you mine again. Ought a father to act so selfishly? Ought we only to love those who love us? Chide me, dearest Sarah, chide me. I thought more of my own joy in you than of you yourself. And if I were now to lose this joy, but who then says that I must lose it? You will live. You will still live long. Banish all these black thoughts. Elephant magnifies the danger. He put the whole house in an uproar and hurried away himself to fetch the doctors whom he probably will not find in this miserable place. I saw his passionate anxiety, his hopeless sorrow, without being seen by him. Now I know that he loves you sincerely. Now I do not grudge him you any longer. I will wait here for him and lay your hand in his. What I would otherwise have done only by compulsion, I now do willingly, since I see how dear you are to him. Is it true that it was Marwood herself who caused you this terror? I could understand this much from your Betty's lamentations, but nothing more. But why do I inquire into the causes of your illness when I ought only to be thinking how to remedy it? I see you growing fainter, 
Every moment I see it and stand here helplessly. What shall I do, wait well? Whither shall I run? What shall I give her? My fortune? My life? Speak! Dearest father, all help would be in vain. The dearest help purchased with your life would be of no avail. Scene 10 Do I dare to set my foot again in this room? Is she still alive? Step nearer, Meliphant. Am I to see your face again? No, Sarah, I return without consolation, without help. Despair alone brings me back. But whom do I see? You, sir? Unhappy father, you have come to a dreadful scene. Why did you not come sooner? You are too late to save your daughter. But be comforted. You shall not have come too late to see yourself revenged. Do not remember in this moment, Maliphant, that we have ever been at enmity. We are so no more, and we shall never be so again. Only keep my daughter for me, and you shall keep a wife for yourself. Make me a god, and then repeat your prayer. I have brought so many misfortunes to you already, Sarah, that I do not hesitate to announce the last one. You must die. And do you know by whose hand you die? I do not wish to know it. That I can suspect it is already too much. You must know it, for who could be assured that you did not suspect wrongly? Marwood writes thus. He reads. When you read this letter, Melifont, your infidelity will already be punished in its cause. I had made myself known to her, and she had swooned with terror. Betty did her utmost to restore her to consciousness. I saw her taking out a soothing powder, and the happy idea occurred to me of exchanging it for a poisonous one. I feigned to be moved, and anxious to help her, and prepared the draught myself. I saw it given to her, and went away triumphant. Revenge and rage have made me a murderess, but I will not be like a common murderess who does not venture to boast of her deed. I am on my way to Dover. You can pursue me, and let my own handwriting bear witness against me. If I reach the harbour unpursued, I will leave Arabella behind unhurt. Till then I shall look upon her as a hostage. Marwood. Now you know all, Sarah. Here, sir, preserve this paper. You must bring the murderess to punishment, and for this it is indispensable. How motionless he stands. Give me this paper, Meliphant. I will convince myself with my own eyes. He hands it to her, and she looks at it for a moment. Shall I still have sufficient strength? Tears it. What are you doing, Sarah? Marwood will not escape her fate, but neither you nor my father shall be her accusers. I die, and forgive the hand through which God chastens me. Alas, my father, what gloomy grief has taken hold of you? I love you still, Meliphant. And if loving you is a crime, how guilty shall I enter yonder world? Would I might hope, dearest father, that you would receive a son in place of a daughter, and with him you will have a daughter too, if you will acknowledge Arabella as such. You must fetch her back, Meliphant. Her mother may escape. Since my father loves me, why should I not be allowed to deal with this love as with a legacy? I bequeath this fatherly love to you and Arabella." Speak now and then to her of a friend from whose example she may learn to be on her guard against love. A last blessing, my father. Who would venture to judge the ways of the highest? Console your master, Waitwell. But you too stand there in grief and despair, you who lose in me neither a lover nor a daughter. We are to be giving you courage, and your dying eyes are giving it to us. No more, my earthly daughter, half angel already. Of what avail can the blessing of a mourning father be to a spirit upon whom all blessings of heaven flow? Leave me a ray of light which raises you so far above everything human, or pray to God who hears no prayer so surely as that of a pious and departing soul. Pray to him that this day may be the last of my life also. God must let the virtue which has been tested remain long in this world as an example. Only the weak virtue which would perhaps succumb to too many temptations is quickly raised above the dangerous confines of the earth. 
For whom do these tears flow, my father? They fall like fiery drops upon my heart, and yet, yet they are less terrible to me than mute despair. Conquer it, Maliphant. My eyes grow dim. That sigh was the last. But where is Betty? Now I understand the wringing of her hands. Poor girl, let no one reproach her with carelessness. It is excused by a heart without falsehood and without suspicion of it. The moment is come. Maliphant, my father, dies. She dies. Ah, oh, let me kiss this cold hand once more. Throwing himself at her feet. No, I will not venture to touch her. The old saying that the body of the slain bleeds at the touch of the murderer frightens me. And who is her murderer? Am I not he more than Marwood? Rises. She is dead now, sir. She does not hear us any more. Curse me now. Vent your grief in well-deserved curses. May none of them miss their mark, and may the most terrible be fulfilled twofold. Why do you remain silent? She is dead. She is certainly dead. Now again I am nothing but Melifont. I am no more the lover of a tender daughter whom you would have reason to spare in him. What is that? I do not want your compassionate looks. This is your daughter. I am her seducer. But think yourself, sir, in what way can I rouse your anger? This budding beauty, who was yours alone, became my prey. For my sake her innocent virtue was abandoned. For my sake she tore herself from the arms of her beloved father. For my sake she had to die. You make me impatient with your forbearance, sir. Let me see that you are a father. I am father, Maliphant, and too much of a father not to respect the last wish of my daughter. Let me embrace you, my son, for whom I could not have paid a higher price. Not so, sir. This angel enjoined more than human nature is capable of. You cannot be my father. Behold, sir. Drawing the dagger from his bosom. This is the dagger which Mawa drew upon me today. To my misfortune, I disarmed her. Had I fallen a guilty victim of her jealousy, Sarah would still be living. You would have your daughter still, and have her without Melifont. It is not for me to undo what is done, but to punish myself for it is still in my power. He stabs himself and sinks down at Sarah's side. Hold him, wait well. What new blow upon my stricken head? Oh, would that my own might make the third dying heart here? Maliphant, dying. I feel it. I have not struck false. If now you will call me your son and press my hand as such, uh, I shall die in peace. Sir William embraces him. You have heard of an Arabella for whom Sarah pleaded. I should also plead for her, but she is Marwood's child as well as mine. What strange feeling seizes me? Mercy! Oh, Creator, mercy! If the prayers of others are now of any avail, wait well. Let us help him to pray for this mercy. He dies, alas! He was more to pity than to blame. Scene 11 Doctors, sir. If they can work miracles, they may come in. Let me no longer remain at this deadly spectacle. One grave shall enclose both. Come, and make immediate preparations, and then let us think of Arabella. Be she who she may, she is the legacy of my daughter. Exeunt End of Act 5 End of Miss Sarah Sampson by G. E. Lessing Translated by Ernest A. Bell